Hey everybody, it's Josh Rutledge, your co-host for Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support us more, please head over to our website, fearscapepodcast.com. There you can click on store and browse some really awesome t-shirts and maybe pick a couple up. Or even go to our Patreon page and see how you can support us monthly. We love bringing you awesome content just as much as you like listening to it. Enjoy the show. Fearscape Media Network. Exploring the unknown. One podcast at a time. Hello. I'm so glad you could join us. I hope you brought your blanket to hide under... The spooky crew is going to discuss things and events from other realms. Ghosts. Cryptids. Aliens. Be sure to hold your blanket extra tight as the boys take you deep into the fear scale, fear scale, fear scale. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another uh, flight fantastic episode of Fearscape Paranormal Podcast here on the Fearscape Media Network. Uh, my name is Stefan. I am your host, as usual, and I am joined, uh, as also usual, by my uh, host. Uh, that's my co-host uh, that smells like unbuttered toast, uh, Josh Rutledge. Hey, man, how's it going? Pretty good. Um, that was the most awkward transition that I think I've ever heard on the show. Yeah. Also, uh, uh, thanks of that song, that Flip Fantasia song. It's yeah. like Flight Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Dun, 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 dun. Flight Fantastic. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm shaking in my boots, shaking in my boots, shaking in, shaking in, shaking in my boots. Uh, if you haven't already seen by the description of said episode, we do have the uh, silent partner here of Fearscape with us. Uh, <laughs> Santosh himself has joined us for this episode uh, because not only is he joining us for the Mothman episode, he joined us for the Indrid Cold episode, and he joined us on our trip to Point Pleasant. Santosh, how's it going? Woohoo! Yeah, yeah. Exactly Happy to be here. Happy to be exactly. included on all the shenanigans in this flappiest of episodes. Flappiest, moth, exactly. Moth. Yeah, see, that's what I'm <laughs> talking about. Go to the light, moth. Man. Um, <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, so not only are we going to be talking about uh, the legend and, and history of the Mothman sightings that happened around Point Place and all that stuff, uh, we're also going to be discussing, and, I, and we talked a little bit about this in our Flatwoods Monster episode last week, but we're going to be talking about the trip that the three of us took down to West Virginia, uh, specifically Point Pleasant. Actually, it's probably north um, to uh, go Mothman hunting. Yeah. Um, we got to go Mothman hunting. We got to uh, talk to uh, Jeff at the Mothman Museum, which we'll have an interview from him as well. Um, he was so great. Everyone was great. The Mothman Museum, all that stuff. The people of Point Pleasant were absolutely phenomenal, as well as, like we said, the people of Flatwoods and Sutton yeah. and damn near everywhere we went. We just had a really great time. Uh, and we'll be discussing all of that soon. Um, and of course, like I said, we're going to be talking about Mothman today and yep. the whole thing that happened there in the 60s in Point Pleasant. Uh, and uh, But before we get to that, we need to get into the Psychic Word of the Week. And now, the Psychic Word of the Week. All right, so uh, as 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 I usually do, I flipped through the pages and uh, stopped on page six hundred and eighty-seven, not six six six. So close, so close. Uh, and the word that caught my eye first was the word witness. Um, and so far, from what I've read, it's not the uh, it, it is not the uh, Harrison Ford movie. So, um, just wanted to put that out there. Uh, isn't that about wonder, a bunch of Amish people? Like the Harrison Ford movie Witness? Yeah, isn't that oh. about? Yeah, I think that there was like a murder in uh, an, an Amish town. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't think that I've ever heard of. Oh, it's a great movie. It's just been a long time since I've seen it. I'm almost certain. Yeah, he's in. So he's like having to protect this Amish guy because there was a murder and he's got to solve it and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but anyways, how did they take crime scene photos? Uh, <laughs> well, the cops can do it. Graph. It's, it's, it's just the Amish folks can't. It's not oh, the okay. witness. It's just witness. I see you typing. Um, anyways, so there are a few definitions. Hezekiah, he's a hell, he's a hell of a whittler. He, he's a crime scene whittler. He's a crime scene <laughs> whittler. Good lord. <laughs> oh yeah, Kelly McGillis in this and Lucas Haas when he was really little. Don or uh, yeah, Danny Glover. That's a good. Patty right? Lapone's in this and Look so was that. Vigo Mortensen. Man, nineteen eighty five. See, yeah, it's an Amish kid over there. Anyway, for those of you that know, <laughs> we pull our psychic word of the week from the Encyclopedic Psychic Dictionary, written by June G. Bletzer, PhD. Rest in peace, honey buns. Uh, and again, the word is witness. And uh, there are a few definitions. The first one uh, has in parentheses penduluming. So that's twice that, that word's come up in our conversation, even though uh, it was not recorded. The first part. Uh, anyways, it says. An article belonging to the person in question, but who is absent. In the process of radiesthetic sense, the left hand of the psychic is placed on the witness and the right hand holds the pendulum. Uh, E.g. the witness could uh, be the dog's food dish when trying to locate the dog. Uh, this is also known as the law of contagion, um, telediagnosis. Uh, the second... Uh, the second, um, oh my God, definition <laughs> uh, has in parentheses electronic voices. And this is one that um, just talked to somebody about, and I just heard this on a podcast. It says the witness is one who receives the telephone call from a deceased person and talks, not realizing that on the other end of the wire is one who has died. Um, also known as phone calls from the dead. Uh, number three, this one comes from the Bible, says outer manifestations, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. Uh, four is mystical tradition, which says uh, the mind behind the scenes, the part that watches the watcher, identifying with a wider dimension than a person's usual fragmented consciousness. This level is consciousness of a higher dimension. Uh, synonym here at the bottom is super conscious mind. So I'd just like to say, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Somebody had to say it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's also, you can have witnesses when you're being slayed in the spirit as well. <laughs> 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 just to call that one back. Right. Uh, but yeah, very, very interesting. Um, some new definitions for witnesses I hadn't really heard before, especially the uh, telekinetic telepathic one or whatever where they uh, put the hand on I guess I have but it, I, I've heard well, of say, it I've, differently I've, I haven't heard it been called a witness before well, yeah, I mean, I, but you always hear or maybe at least I always hear whenever people talk about trying to commune with ones that have you know passed on mm -hmm. they always say you know bring something that belonged to them right right so that's what I'm saying I know the, um, the process what that is called but the actual object being called a witness uh, I had never heard before, so I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, um, new on me. Uh, as well as the phone calls from the dead being called witnessing, because you know in Christianity, you're like, "Hey, I know this dead dude who came back. And <laughs> <laughs> can he I call me. you later?" He called me. <laughs> he, had to, maybe. he had to use his MCI long distance plan. Yeah. <laughs> Freaking MCI, get out of here, man! <laughs> ten, ten, three, two, one. I hear you. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah. So that that that's our psychic word for the week. Thank you again, June Bletzer. Um, always fascinating, and I'm already curious as to how this is going to tie into what we're talking about. <laughs> Which, like I said, literally today I was listening to a podcast, and this guy talked about he knew uh, that his mom. Uh, so I was listening to a podcast about the happy face killer and uh, this was one of the victims and he said he knew his mom was okay because he had gotten a phone call from her like two years after she had died and he knew that that meant that she had moved on to a better place because all it said was hello sweetie I miss you hmm. and it was her voice and no one had he had just bought a burner phone so no one had the number um, things like that so I, I find that very interesting that that's the word that you know pops up today when that was something I listened to similarly today yeah Interesting. So, as usual. Um, all right. So, yeah, that's our psychic word of the week. So let's quickly move into a little bit of spooky news. Uh, 
All right, uh, Josh, you actually found this story for me, um, and it's a very, very interesting one. Uh, and if you're wanting to, you can check our Facebook page. Uh, we have posted it there as well. This comes from uh, news dash intact.com uh, part of their series they have a number of different series this one's called ancient files uh, the headline here reads university professor reveals he discovered a population of fairies and publicly shows the proof so yeah says professor john hyatt has recently issued quite a bizarre statement to say the least he reported that he had met up in the past with multiple strange creatures that were never before reported by the academia and according to them they do not exist to begin with either needless to say making such statements is always just inviting trouble as most people will begin shunning you down for it and mocking you almost instantly boy isn't that the case with almost yep. anything yeah, paranormal much, yeah. uh, the only way to fight the criticism is with hard earned evidence which is exactly what John brought over he claimed that a whole civilization of fairies lives in the English countryside of Rossendale and he's brought pictures to back up his claims too now before I even talk about the rest of this I find it funny that we posted a meme the other day is how funny is it how people believe in the paranormal really easily yet the second there's any evidence immediately it's a fake right yeah and it sucks because that is the age that we live in now that it's very very easy to fake something so there is never going to be any true evidence ever until literally every single yeah. person on the planet sees it with their own eyes in front of them is what and, and you know it's funny you, because that's the whole flat earth you know how <laughs> you know how people in the summertime at least we've always done it you know you go out and you catch lightning bugs and you mm -hmm. put them in a jar so until somebody catches fairies and puts them, puts them, in, puts a them jar. in a jar I mean, well even then it's yeah. like you know they're like it was you 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 messed things up i don't know <laughs> mess things up not the right word anyways he goes on to say or the the article goes on to say he stated that the fairies are very similar to us physically except for the overall size of the body were practically identical to one another he's not the only one with proof however as back in 2009 a woman named phyllis bacon who she smells good <laughs> snapped a quick photo of what appears to be a living fairy flying around in her garden in new addington southern london uh now just looking at these two pictures uh they look almost identical to the uh, ones that this guy took a picture of. Um, but she says, but it doesn't end here. Francis Griffiths also reportedly fell into a stream while playing around with these fairies back in 1917. According to most reports, it is actually quite impossible to resist their temptation. And if they seek something that you can provide, you can't fight it in the slightest. Um, so yeah, there's a video there that you can watch that has footage. There's some pictures. Uh, like I said, that is on our Facebook page. So go ahead and check that out. And what do you guys think about all this? Well, it's, it's funny that, uh, that this, you know, thinking back about my little ring, uh, camera capture that was a few weeks or months ago. And, it, you know, Santosh, you said, you know, if I didn't know that was a moth, I'd say that it looked like a fairy with a, like a cloak or something on, but, mm -hmm. but what if it's not a moth? You know, I mean, stranger things, right? Yeah. It, it's interesting well, because the first set of pictures, I, I can definitely see a little bit, but the second set that he's got on here to me, I mean, they do, they just look like bugs. I mean, they almost kind of look like, because it's kind of fuzzy, of course, um, it kind of looks like the, um, I don't remember which one it is, the really, really big mosquitoes, the one that don't suck your blood if it's the male or the female. Mayfly? Mayflower. Mayfly. No, they're they're Mayfly. just mosquitoes. It's just either male or female. One sucks blood, one doesn't. And they're the big ones that are always hanging out on your wall. Cane flies, I've heard them called, I thought. It's, it's yeah. called but a mayfly. Those are the gigantic ones. No, I, I'm from Ohio. I know what mayflies are, and they're gross. Um, that's not <laughs> <laughs> and they're gross. Yeah, they are. They don't. They don't even have mouths. Um, it, that's creepy. Um, but anyways, um, but yeah, it kind of looks like a bug. But then you look at the other one down here, and you could see it. But it's like, yeah, I don't know. And it's so of course, even me, my skeptical brain is going, oh, I don't know, because you know, I. But I do believe in fairies, though. But I mean, like, I. It's weird. I. I, I know. I don't know how. I, if I believe them in the physical manifestation that this this person is trying to prove as much as an etheric kind of entity type uh dimensional type thing um you know i definitely think brian froud believes in them for sure <laughs> so, so why, why couldn't that you know kind of a theoric entity not uh make itself known on the physical plane it, it could I, I mean it's just hey look I, this is the smallest i've ever seen um mm -hmm. footage of fairies i mean these things look like they're not any bigger than maybe your thumbnail um is what i can gauge uh, maybe a little bit bigger 
Um, but I mean, you know, even like the Molina size. Yeah. It's like, even like the, what were they? The cottonwood fairies? Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Um, those ones were still much bigger, um, than what this proposes. So a little bit of a a foreshadowing for later on in the episode, but in one of our experiences this, this past weekend in Point Pleasant, uh, something that was said was the Fae are real. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Well, okay. So I, now that you've brought it up, I've been holding on to this cause I didn't want to open this whole can of worms is fairies is a catch all. And it's also sort of a stolen mm-hmm. catch all and yeah. Fae has its roots in, in, in Celtic folklore. And the, these whole, even if you were to call them Demi Fae, these little miniaturized people eyes, you know, like personified not personified, that's not the right word, more anthropomorphized versions of them are, are sort of a bastardization of, of myth and folklore at this point. And so, I don't know, but I even kind of, I dig it all. I dig the roots of it and those beings and then whatever thought forms came along to fill the space of what we now call it that because i love that you brought up brian froud i love his art Mm. and that's kind of what i vibe with most in my definition as well right like a whole range of species of non-humanoid oh yeah because even then you get into it i mean you've got got differences there like the brownies and and different sprites and all kinds of different things that are all it's such a catch-all word Fay fairy yeah so uh whatever happened to fay ray right (laughs) Shout out to Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah. So, go ahead and check that out. Let us know uh, if you um, see the Facebook post or uh, let us know if you're on Instagram or Twitter what you think about this article and whether or not you think that the fairy or fae are real. Be be curious to see what you guys think. Um, but anyways, on that, I guess we're ready to rock and roll and get into our topic tonight um, because we are going to skip UFO sighting of the week because we have our own UFO sighting that'll be a part of Creepy Ketchup. And we're going to push Creepy Ketchup to the end because we want to talk about everything that happened this past weekend, which a lot of stuff yeah. happened that we would talk about via Creepy Ketchup. So we're going to add all that together and just make it a mega Creepy Ketchup at the end mixed in with our <laughs> UFO sightings and as mega well as creepy our, ketchup. As well as the experience <laughs> in Point Pleasant and stuff. Yeah. Mega creepy, creepy ketchup. Uh, Wednesday, but, Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. No, I need you to make it sound like a transformer. Okay. You, you go yeah. Mega. <laughs> mega. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so let's let's move into our topic for the week, uh, the Mothman. All right, Josh. So uh, we're going to talk first about um, the history of the Mothman and all that stuff. And uh, we'll try to refrain a little bit from stuff that happened to us this weekend to save towards the end. Um, But this is remarkable. And for those of you that are constant listeners, you know that we've been leading up to this for quite some time. Uh, We started talking about it with Hellier uh, because that kind of pushed us to read Keel's book, Mothman Prophecy, which opened the door if you listen to our journey so far that opened the door to everything all kinds of all stuff. kinds of stuff that we've been reading and everything keeps pointing to point pleasant and parkersburg and flatwoods and this whole little triangular area of west virginia and so we decided to go down there before we ever do an episode on mothman and of course this area is also where injured cold sighting happened yep. during the mothman stuff uh, which is another reason why we wanted santosh not only with us on the weekend but with us on the show since he was our guest for the injured cold episode. So he yeah. So let's, let's get yes, cracking. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeshua. What do we got here? All right. So on uh, November 12th, that's my uh, sister's birthday. Uh, it's the day before my brother's birthday. Ooh. Not in 1966. Though. Oh, <clears throat> in 1966. <laughs> uh, in Clendenin, Clendenin, West Virginia, A a grave digger working in a cemetery spotted something strange. He glanced up from his work when something huge soared over his head. A massive figure that was moving rapidly across the cemetery from tree to tree. He later described the figure as a brown human being. Well, that's racist. I don't mean, everybody describes it. Is this the beginning of Macbeth? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I'm like, I've never, I guess I missed this sighting. I've never heard this one before, um, at least that I recall. Yeah, this is, feels awkward. <laughs> Grave digger, ominous presence. Yeah. Sets in, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I mean, you asked me to find the information. No, I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, uh, this was actually the first reported sighting, uh, although, you know, the most famous is, is the next one to come. Yeah, like I said, I didn't yep. even know. I always thought the other one was the first one. So, uh, three days later, uh, at the after the Gravedigger's report in nearby Point Pleasant, West Virginia, two couples noticed a gray winged creature about six or seven feet tall standing in front of the car uh, they were all seated in right so this is scarberry and mallet right and and their girlfriends they were all in one car together uh out at the munition at the uh the tnt area yeah the tnt area the power plant and all that stuff at that point was already closed down i mean it was closed but it was still at that point in time it was like 15 years closed uh as opposed to what it is now which is Gone. Uh, gone. Yeah. yeah the so. only thing left are the domes, which we'll talk about yep. a lot, which is where they stored the ammunition. Because not only did they do power, because um, there was a power plant, but they also did TNT and, and all sorts of different explosives and stuff well, like that. Yeah. So what it was, just for anybody who may not know, uh, during World War II, we needed a lot of munitions. Um, so they would stand up these plants all over the place. You know, there was one across the river. Yeah, in Charlestown, from Indiana. Us, you know, mm-hmm. in, in close by to Louisville. Uh, but there were these all over these places. And they would they would figure out ways to disguise them uh, from the air. Like I remember reading an article about this place down in Kentucky close to Bowling Green where they actually draped uh, huge nets over top of buildings so that if you flew over top of it, it just looked like a field. <laughs> It's just like an empty field. It's like an empty field. Yeah. Just like the World War II where they had the blow up tanks and stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but anyway, so there's this ammunition depot uh, or, or manufacturing place. And so as as a part of that, obviously you can you can imagine it required a large draw of power. So they built a, a, a North Power Station there to help with the, the building of those ammuni- ammunitions and all that kind of stuff. So all of that it was is is there at the time of the sighting though it was no longer being used by the military and so it was pretty much abandoned and and as you can imagine uh, uh, people who were horny would go out there right so, and, and so quickly <laughs> you're saying that the domes as they call them now were the igloos that was a way to disguise uh, you were saying like where they were storing ammunition and so stuff. You, you noticed that when we went out there they're all overgrown yeah they were always like that. Okay. Oh. So okay. that if you oh. so if you flew over, you wouldn't see anything. So it just looked like Hobbiton. <laughs> from, <laughs> the would, Shire. <laughs> from, from, from the air, you wouldn't even see them as domes. Oh, it would just look flat. It would just look flat. Okay. Yeah. And it was in a heavily wooded area, yeah. um, which is now a wildlife preserve. And it's right there on the Ohio River, which is now it's like right across from from the in new Ohio from the new plant. nuclear power plant. Which at the time in nineteen sixty six was brand new. Right. So, right. So, but anyways, so Sorry, that's, I just wanted to share that for people didn't know. Yeah. So that was, you know, that's kind of where they were. So again, they're going out there to park, you know, mm-hmm. you remember what parking means mm-hmm. and, um, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't see you do air quotes, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was saying Josh did and he's left. <laughs> so, um, so they go out there to, to kind of hanging out and, um, just like standing in front of their car is this gray uh, winged creature, like I said, about six or seven feet tall. And uh, so they they like peel out of there and this thing chases them. Right, because um, it seemed to want to get out of the light. Right. Which, which if it's a moth, Off, it'd be going right. towards the light. But <laughs> right. I mean, whatever. Um, so it chases them. And then finally, you know, they, they said that it was like 100 miles an hour is how fast it was able to fly. Um, and then it just all of a sudden, just like when they got to a certain point close to the town of Point Pleasant, it just disengaged and and flew off over a field. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, in Gray Barker's book, The Silver Bridge, which talks about this, he goes into a little more detail, and he talks about they actually had three instances with 
the Mothman on the way out of there. Um, Cause there was another point where they stopped. They're like, uh, 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 and it's like, it shows up again and follows them and goes up above them and then to the side of them. So they can see this thing fly next to them and above them. Um, and they're just scared out of their mind. And then there was even a point, I think it was them were like, they, uh, no, no, thinking of something else. But yeah, so this, there were like three instances where they thought they got away and then there it was again. <laughs> You know what this what this whole thing really reminds me of, and it makes me wonder if this is what that movie was really written based off of is Jeepers Creepers. Je- I would not be surprised if they didn't get their influence from Mothman Prophecy for sure. Yeah, because um, I mean it like leaps from tree to tree, and it mm-hmm. you know you know. But anyways, so and it does it takes straight off you know like straight up mm-hmm. when it takes off. Yeah, we we figured you out, Jeepers Creepers people. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, have you seen that meme that says that this year is the next year for the Jeepers Creepers monster? Yes. 97, I think, was the last, and isn't it every, or 93 or 97, and it's either 23 or 27 something. Yeah, something. I know they just did Jeepers Creepers 3 last year. Um, It went, like, straight to video. I haven't watched it. No, I didn't even know there was a third one. Yeah. Like I said, it went, they, they like, kickstarted money for it, and it went straight to VOD uh, and DVD. Um, so I think it might be on Shutter. What I always thought was interesting is that between one and two, there's no time lapse. <laughs> like one, <laughs> like two picks up right where one left. I mean, as far as timeline yeah. goes. Yeah. Anyways, we're not talking about Jeepers. Creepers. No, we're talking about my man. <laughs> so, so they are so, and, and we, we, you know, I think, I think you said this much in, in Gray's book, but our interview with uh, Jeff uh, for the Mothman Museum also uh, said this, you know, that, that they didn't go report to the police. Uh, they didn't go to the newspaper right away. They went to a local uh, diner and like woke the owner up mm-hmm. and and told him all about it. And he was so concerned about their story that he is yeah, the one. Yeah, he's the one that went to the sheriff. Right. Which makes you wonder if he had seen something too, you know, yeah. that he didn't want to say anything and use them as the, the shield there. So after mm-hmm. it went to the sheriff's, then of course the newspaper picked it up. Um, cause once you report it to the police, it becomes a public record and mm-hmm. anybody can look at it. And then, um, the newspaper picked it up and, uh, you know, it, it, basically he's, you know, so the wit- one of the main witnesses, Scarberry, you know, he insisted that, uh, the, the apparition could not have been a figment of, as, of his imagination. He said, if I had seen it while by myself, I wouldn't have said anything. But there were four of us who saw it. Yeah, and the thing is, is most people think that these were teenagers that went out there. They were not. They were uh, actually probably around 19 or 20. Um, and they were like out of work mine yeah. workers and things like that who were really frustrated. And um, all the teachers had talked about, uh, and they, again, this is in Gray's book, all the teachers talked about what reliable people they were. They all had good grades yeah. um, and things like that. They'd never got in trouble. And it, this isn't something that would fit them. And just for clarification, if you're 19, you're still a teenager because it's 19. Well, I'm, what I meant was high school. I, they weren't high school kids. I'm just, I'm just giving you a hard time. Like a teenager. Hey, whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, man. I'm telling my mom. <clears throat> but um, so, you know, of course, the papers at this point were skeptical. They were calling it a bird and a mysterious creature. Um, although they did print Mallet's description, which was, it was like a man with wings. Mm-hmm. Um, See, it's not a man, Santosh. It's a chicken boo. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to make you aware. So over like the next uh, three days from that point, uh, the Gettysburg Times reported eight additional sightings, um, including two volunteer firefighters who saw it and they described it as a very large bird with red eyes, large mm-hmm. red eyes. Um, so then one sighting was from a Salem, West Virginia resident who told, uh, about strange patterns that appeared on his television screen. Now this, this gets into what Keel's book, the Mothman prophecies really talks Uh, about. Um, but I won't harp anymore about the fact that if you've only seen the movie, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, he noticed some strange patterns on his TV, uh, and also heard a bunch of mysterious sounds outside. He went outside and he shined a flashlight towards the direction of the noise and witnessed two red eyes resembling bicycle reflectors looking back at him. 
Um, he also uh, lost his dog <laughs> that night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a detailed story about that that I've read that's really sad. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I had, you know, I hadn't heard about the volunteer firefighters. And, you know, you're always looking for credible witnesses. Yeah. Yet when you get a credible witness, all of a sudden they, are not credible right um and it's 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 just interesting and yes that you know the bird with the large red eyes is when we get into the skeptics talking about which i yeah. don't know if you have planned to talk about that yeah or not, so but. i've got a little bit of information here that basically says that so a, a doctor in the area or an associate a professor of wildlife and biology at west virginia university immediately dismissed the notion of a flying monster um <clears throat> and basically said that all of these sightings could be attributed to the sand hill crane which stands almost as tall as an average adult man and has bright red flesh around its eyes. Yeah, so, you know, we looked up the Sandhill Crane. It does not stand as tall. I mean, it, it <laughs> it's does. It's like four feet. Like, But it does, like, so if you were to, if, if it were to fully extend from feet to, like, neck fully extended, it might get close to five feet tall. Yeah, might get close to five. Um, but these people are reporting six to 10 feet and a 10 yeah. foot wingspan. Like to me, it doesn't fit it. Now, I guess I can do the red eyes because they do. They have this red giant patches where their eyes are, but it's non-reflective. Yeah, I was say, it's not reflective. So I, I mean, I maybe it was moist. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and the fact is, is that Sandhill cranes are not known to be around that area um very often they are they do show up but it's very fake rare news sir fake news especially <laughs> are the problem the scourge of this country and the paranormal <laughs> investigators enemy naturally opposed to one another. right well They're the other always reason rolling around pulling pranks on us it's always the sandhill cranes it's well, gotta be the other reason i am very anti sandhill crane here <laughs> is that um even if we do say oh they do show up in west Virginia guess what they don't show up in winter because they're already headed they have already gone south for the winter so mm -hmm. to have multiple 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 sightings of sandhill cranes in the middle of November in West Virginia just seems unplausible to me now another theory that I was able to dig up um, says that it was actually it was a crane but it was deformed and mutated. <laughs> I have heard this because too. of all the chemicals and stuff that were dumped in the TNT area. Right, because they did. They found red water and they yeah. found all kinds of stuff, and they do. And they did find some mutated animals over the years uh, from uh, from some of the waste and everything that was dumped improperly and yep. stuff like that. But come on, man, <laughs> like, well, yeah. plus, I mean, it sounds like a trauma movie at this I mean, point. That's exactly where I was going. Thank you. I mean, if a large crane is standing in now, you know, I understand it's not LED bulbs. You know, these are back in the days of more halogen bulbs and stuff like that. But still, if a large crane is standing in front of your car, are you going to mistake that for a man? No, especially no, right. If, that's if a little wet, regardless yeah, of how looking big. at it's chicken legs. Silhouette. I mean, it's got yeah, normal. Especially looking at those chicken legs. <laughs> it's got normal bird legs, and no one referred to the bird legs to its like skinny chicken legs. Right? Yeah, they. <laughs> I mean, why would you think it's a man? And it's got a really long neck with a very small head. When everything talks about this very wide head, and almost in some cases, no head. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. They're just just like, eyes like no sitting neck. on the yeah. shoulders, like. So another theory uh, says that uh, these are, of course, all, you know, debunking theories. But another theory is, is that it was a committed prankster who went so far as to hide in the abandoned World War II munitions plant where many of the sightings occurred. Uh, the theory goes that when the national press ran with the Mothman story spreading it across the country, panic set in. Locals became convinced they were seeing the Mothman and birds and other large animals even long after the prankster had given up. I mean, yes. Here's the, again, I've mentioned this before. My problem with skeptics is that just because you can think of something that could debunk it doesn't mean it's debunked. Because I can say that for anything. Yes, I can say, well, Donald Trump can't be president because it's possible that a reptile has dove into his skin and is now taking over. 
well, that that doesn't take away from the fact that you know. Like, yeah. But in any event, there's also pranksters. There were act, you know, like the clown sightings. There's, you know, right. like like. Uh, sorry, right. that maybe that's not the best one, but you know what I'm saying. Like that yeah. was several pranksters doing a thing, but we've also had creepy things of that that actually happening. Right. right, you know, like, and then people take that into a prank and perpetuate it, and that doesn't mean that the original, you know, Gacy type nonsense wasn't going on. Right. Well, and just like we talked about in the fairy thing, it's like it, it sucks that we've reached a point where we don't accept anything. You know that yeah. that unless you see it with your own eyes, um, but if you're the only one, you're told you have to question it. But then here you've got, I mean, I think they had like what twenty seven sightings, they like 20, six. 20. 26 sightings over the course of a year. Yeah, and that was multiple people like yep. in each sighting. How is that not enough? I but. mean, at one point in time in Kiel's book, he talks about going over to the uh, old power plant with the sheriff mm-hmm. and then being chased out by the thing. And the sheriff saw it. Yeah. So, I mean, if that's not any more, you know, plausible. But so another kind of debunking thought there is, and I don't know, this, this to me fits closer in with what Keel is trying to say in a lot of his books. Mm-hmm. So it says the Mothman also bears a striking resemblance to several demon archetypes found among those who have experienced sleep paralysis, perhaps suggesting that the visions are nothing more than the embodiment of typical human fears pulled from the depths of the unconscious and grafted onto mm-hmm. real life bird or animal sightings when people paint. But all four mm-hmm. in that in yeah. that second sighting would see the same thing. See the same thing right. without discussing things. Yeah. I mean, it's not like they were having conversations about man, and we've all had nightmares where people like night hags are standing <laughs> over us. Right. That didn't happen. Damn it, Josh. That was a good one. That one. That one knocked me down a peg though because, you know. <laughs> Satan, and I'm using air quotes here, didn't look like Satan looks now until yeah. it was popularized. Now people see that right. shape much, that silhouette more. Damn it, Josh, you just ruined everything for me. <laughs> Are you a Sand Hills crane? Are you a Sand Hills crane? <laughs> By the way, we need to put Sand Hill crane on a t shirt. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> well, and, you know, the, the other thing we, we dig into, and I know you're going to talk about it just a hair coming up next, but it's like this thing that Keel really talked about and um that gray talks about in his book too is that the thing that drew them to point pleasant wasn't even mothman at first it was this flap of ufo sightings that was happening in the area i mean a huge flap was taking place and and it went from like nothing really happening for like 10 years to all of a sudden in like the the 60s here it's just ufo sightings and concentrated Mm -hmm. in this area i mean what 52 was the biggest previous flap, right? Yeah, yeah, and and this is where we, yeah, because that's even around the time where the Flatwoods, White House and when the Flatwoods is crashed fifty two, yeah, so or whatever, not crash, but you know, that Stanford one was in seventy two, right? So about around in sets of six, so 62, maybe seventy two, maybe fifty two. So we're about to hit know. another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so it's here's this huge flap that's happening. So, you know, this is where Keel's book really gets into deep as well as this connection to um, what he calls ultra terrestrials or uh, extraterrestrials and these UFO sightings. Um, and uh, Keel was not the first person to coin the phrase uh, ultra terrestrial, but he was the one that made it popular, popular which is essentially yeah. that these that these things could be um, an advanced species from our own earth um, because it is that's something that we think about a lot is that this could have been more than likely an alien because you know listening to the injured cold episode that we did this Woody Derenberger's sighting with injured cold happened during the midst of all of this right we drove up to where the site was um, and it's like 35 minutes north so it's not even that far away from point pleasant so it still yeah. fits that same area of attraction where people are seeing mothman and people are seeing ufos yep. on moss so that leads us into the whole you know the, the paranormal type explanation so um you know a lot of complicated theories to weave together aliens ufos and precognition uh they paint the mothman as either a harbinger of doom or more sinister, sinisterly, its cause. Uh, now, this, of course, all ties back to what leads us into the next topic, which mm-hmm. is the Silver Bridge. Right. So, a Mothman shows up, does all this flying around, is seen, seen all over the place for a year, 
And then a year later, December 15th, 1967, um, there's a tragedy that happens with the Silver Bridge uh, where it, it collapses. Uh, 46 people uh, die uh, in that collapse. And, um, you know, it's been it's been shown that the bridge collapsed because of poor design. I mean, it was built in 1928 back when cars were a lot lighter mm-hmm. and things like that. And Yeah, it, that because that uh, road eventually became a big route for right. truck drivers and things like that. And yet yeah, swayed a lot. But, yeah, one of the uh, locking pins or whatever had rusted and, and busted. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't know that 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 Mothman per se uh, caused that bridge. I mean, it was just poor, poor design and, and poor planning in my opinion. But, um, the, the, uh, the idea that, that, that Mothman appeared as some sort of a, uh, harbinger or like, you know, like a, a, a warning. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like a, a harbinger of doom. A lot of people believe that he was, that he was there as a harbinger of doom to kind of warn people that this, this disaster was coming because there are also um, sightings of Mothman since then that um, supposedly have shown up uh, months or a year before a disaster or even days before there was another bridge collapse that happened not long after this, maybe a few years after this. And people, there are people that claim that they saw uh, Mothman days before on the bridge, much like there are people that claim that they saw Mothman on top of the silver bridge the night before it collapsed. Right. So, I mean, yeah, there's that, I, I think there's even a picture that, that Keel or somebody has in, in like one of their books or something that mm-hmm. depicts Mothman kind of perched atop perched of the top, bridge. Yeah, I think yeah. that I think pretty sure that's Keel's book. Um, but uh, I mean, I, you know, I'll say that in the museum, um, in this talking about this part of it in the museum, it's just it's a very the the pictures that were taken of the scene and stuff. It's just it's just very. I mean, it's a bridge collapse. It's so, awful, yeah, and it was so yeah, it's a tragedy. It's it a was tragedy. December. I mean, so it, like it was cold too. Yeah. I mean, people, some of them froze to death and and things like that. And you do, we we went down there, and you do, you get an eerie sensation along the river there, knowing that that tragedy happened. Um, but what's it, it's just interesting. One dude survived uh, from he was in the sleep. Uh, he was asleep in the back of a truck. Yeah, you know, like a semi kind of thing and was asleep in the back and who uh, his friend that was driving wasn't found yeah like wasn't recovered yep and he, <laughs> yeah he was able to get out and get on top of the tractor trailer yeah and float i mean one gosh kind of, waking up to drowning in a river yeah. what the fuck uh one kind of good i i guess if you could say a good thing that came out of the silver bridge is that congress did then pass the whole uh, bridge review standards and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. our safety regulations, because, I mean, much like what's happening now with our current president, and this is not political, but, you know, like his whole thing is about getting rid of regulations to kind of help businesses and stuff like that. Well, that same thing happened back then. These regulations were gone as to make more money and to push through things faster, and that's what happened. And so every bridge in America was was double checked and, well, and things like that. I remember so. um, it's been a few years ago now, but when they were they were painting one of the bridges that goes over uh, the Ohio from Indiana into Kentucky uh, here in the Louisville area, they were painting it and they found that underneath the bridge, a lot of the decking mm-hmm. it was like breaking apart and a lot of the supports were like about to fail. And so, so they pretty much shut everything down yeah that was the sherman mitten bridge right, right? yeah they, 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 shut, they, it, they shut it down for like a year while they came in and basically bolstered everything back up and, and fixed it so that it would last longer but it makes you you know based on that somebody had had sent me a a documentary i think that history channel did where they basically went around and looked at all the what they call it, the infrastructure of america oh, yeah. And I mean, it's all breaking down. I mean, it's- oh yeah, I, I think Michael Moore just did a doc about the infrastructure. Um, but yeah, it's it is all breaking down, especially because uh, infrastructure is essentially state to state. I mean, I mean, it's really interesting. Like when you go from like. Uh, whatever state is above Louisiana, I can't think at the moment. And as soon as you hit Louisiana, it's Alabama. like the roads are like just destroyed. I mean, you hit the state line, it's like <laughs> yeah. Um, well, sometimes it's like that from county to county. Oh yeah, same, mm-hmm. same, yeah. Um, but one thing I wanted to say was uh, just to talk about synchronicities. 
take a shot. Uh, one of the <laughs> synchronicities here is that while I was looking into uh, Mothman and stuff for today and digging into the Silver Bridge tragedy and stuff, or excuse me, last night, I get a news alert because, you know, as our listeners know, I'm going to be moving out to the Phoenix area. And specifically, my wife and I are looking at Tempe. Um, I get a news alert from Tempe today that uh, last night that says that morning a train derailed going over a train bridge caught on fire. Guess what it was carrying? Lumber. So all the lumber sets on fire and then it causes the bridge to collapse all within Ooh. like 10, 15 minutes um, collapsed over um, Tempe, uh, Tempe Town Lake, which I'm pretty sure is salt salt river feeds into um but yeah it's like right near not far from downtown phoenix i mean tempe is really really close and yeah everyone was talking about i mean this was insane and they're still trying to figure out how it derailed but luckily it had in the back it so like 10 cars i think caught on fire but the three in the back two of them were this this chemical i can't remember what it is but it is both highly flammable and toxic it did not catch fire thank huh. goodness and one that had some sort of rubber solution in it that also would have caught fire um, and created a massive like pollution problem. So at least it was just the wood that caught yeah. on fire. But yeah, so weird that that happened as I'm you know looking into the Silver Bridge and stuff like that. Right. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate here, what makes the Silver Bridge tragedy connect to all of this is that at this after this point no more mothman sightings right it's like it it completed it was like thir it's 13 months i mean it was yeah. just over a year of mothman sightings and then this bridge collapse happened in the same town where this stuff is happening and it, it's hard not to connect the two especially right. since the sightings quit though people say that the media stopped caring because they were more concerned with the bridge and the bridge rebuilding and finding survivors and things like that that they weren't reporting on anything and, and no one put energy towards the mothman essentially. well and, and i think there's just something really to take away here and that is that correlation does not equal causation so right um <clears throat> You know, just because they were in the same place at the same time doesn't mean the one call. But that, I mean, that's where that Harbinger idea yeah. came from, right. is that this massive tragedy happened. And a lot of, you know, theorists have gone back to look at other massive tragedies throughout history and things like that to see if there were any UFO sightings or any sort of yeah. cryptid sightings that took place prior to it as a way to, um, I don't know, compare it to that. Now, you know, just talking uh, briefly about, you know, some of the, um, I don't know, attention that this story got, you know, we know that, uh, of course, there was the big, the you know, John Keel wrote a book, Gray Barker wrote a book before that. Mm -hmm. um, they later made the book that John Keel wrote into a movie. Um, and I'll, I'm, I promised I wouldn't do this, but I'm, I'm going to. If you, if you, if your exposure to the Mothman prophecies is, is the movie you really need to either read the book or listen to the audio book because Keel talks about so much more than Mothman. Yeah, it's like the light bit of story that comes from the book that is in the movie is, is nothing. I mean, it's not even what the book is about. Um, and it's a fictionalized thing. And even uh, in Tanya Derenberger's book, she talks about um, John Keel. Uh, making sure she gets free tickets to the premiere because they, you know, they use injured cold in there because he writes about Woody and injured cold and stuff yep. like that. And of course they make injured cold out to be a bad guy and right. uh, possibly is the Mothman and, and things like that. And Tanya was real upset about that, you know, and Keel had told her too, that this is not what I had wanted. Um, but I had signed a contract without giving rights to, you know, produce and, and have my hand in it. And so this is what Hollywood did did to it yeah um but you know here's 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 some tickets you know and things like that and so yeah that happened the movie's a cool movie i guess i mean it scared the hell out of me when i was a kid yeah um, i mean yeah don't get me wrong the, the first time you see that kind of thing just kind of staying in there with those red eyes looking at you i mean it was it's it's scary but but it really it it is a very hollywood version of the story mm-hmm Yep. So, but yeah, I mean, you got Richard Gere and Deborah Messings in that and a bunch of other folks. Um, it's a fun movie, but yeah, most people think that that's what the Mothman Prophecies book is about. Um, and it's not even it's close not even to that. Close in to fact, it. you know, his account takes place in the 60s, whereas the Mothman takes place 
now i mean in the 90s right yeah, yeah i mean there's nothing about like a love interest or right. any of, unless you count gray barker or jim mosley or something <laughs> like that <laughs> but even alan greenfield was there during a lot of this and like you know they all they all like just met up i mean this is where gray and john keel and those met like they knew each other um from uh publications and the like and stuff like that but yeah gray even talks about the very first time he meets keel and uh they met um actually to go meet woody together so they went to go meet woody derenberger together because they knew they were both in town at the time because uh keel was working very closely with mary hire yeah who was the reporter at the point pleasant newspaper right. and uh, gray was a reporter at the clarksburg newspaper so uh and he i think he did a lot of uh like associated press stuff as well yeah so so i mean it, it, it's just yeah, I mean, I you know I know I rambled on and on about uh, my theories about uh, Mothman was not a cryptid and all that kind of stuff on Facebook, but but really I'm not Facebook, uh, YouTube. But really mm-hmm. the the big takeaway that I would say is that just like anything else, uh, don't watch a video per se or a movie per se and say you know the whole story. Mm-hmm. Dig into it a little bit. Yeah, because like we said, Mothman. It, it's it, you know part of that is him naming the book Mothman Prophecies, but the Mothman is maybe half the book. I wouldn't I mean, even say that. I'm just yeah. like, it's like maybe the first chapter a little bit and the last two chapters is about Mothman. Everything else is about the stuff that really he elaborated on in the eighth tower. Yeah. And yeah, getting into the super spectrum yeah. and um, his idea of ultra terrestrials, as well as a number of different UFO sightings and uh, the UFO sightings he saw while there. Right. Which we tried to we find, tried to find the Bogle Ridge. Ridge, but we couldn't find it on any map. So I think it's a subdivision now, but um, yeah, where him and a number of people would go like clockwork and they would look at, yeah at ufos and he states in many of his books that they seem to happen on wednesday nights which is and saturdays wednesdays and saturdays which is so. uh <laughs> which you know when you think about our most recent uh trip mm-hmm. which i would think we're going to get into here in just a little bit um our uh sighting mm-hmm. was at two o'clock in the morning on saturday morning technically yeah mm-hmm. technically uh santosh what about you any any kind of things here on on mothman to elaborate on yourself i'm all for it <laughs> no, uh, no, no. I mean, heck, you all are covering it. I'm, I'm sort of just waiting for the story part because I, I find it fascinating, and I really like what the, uh, what the dude from the Mothman Museum said. What was Jeff. His name Jeff? Yep. Yeah, Jeff. Um, you know, he, he sort of answered. He asked a question and answered it himself. Like, do I, do I believe it's cryptid or tech or that? And he's like, I don't know, and. I, I sort of thought that was a very smooth yeah, uh, he, answer and, that he gave, and I'm kind of there too. It's like I don't know where I am, whether it's cryptid or whether it's, um, you know, a little more sentient or or you know even advanced than than us. Like that's I I like the bounty hunter sort of um, thing, you know, and the and the kill connection. All I know is that we were dumb to leave ourselves in a concrete dome with only one exit, regardless of what it comes down on. Uh, <laughs> but that's jumping the gun on the story. <laughs> yeah, uh, fascinating. And and just that the, the time period and stretch and the Flatwoods monster being so close by, like all of that different, you know what I'm saying? Like the stories just, they Venn diagram just a little bit. Yeah. here and there they connect to one another and this happened there and there that that's what i find most fascinating yeah ditto Pockets um, of activity yeah i think he had said something like I, yeah i don't know what it is but i know that uh, the people that he has talked to sure the hell believed what they saw yeah um and i do want to get into that because uh i want to get into his interview here real quick um, we got an opportunity to talk to Jeff Wamsley at the Mothman Museum uh, in Point Pleasant. He was gracious enough to uh, give us an interview, um, as well as I want to give a shout out at how much we loved the museum itself. Mm-hmm. And boy, the gift shop got us. Um, I, I think we spent us, us the gift shop. Okay, got so us. me, I spent over a hundred dollars just so I could get a free Mothman bag. Um, we all got something. No, we all we all we all got something. Um, but it was really really cool and. Uh, I really highly recommend it's right next to the uh, Mothman statue there in downtown Point Pleasant. So please, please, please go check out if you're in there, uh, check out the Mothman Museum uh, and say hi to Jeff Wamsley. Now, Jeff um, 
And I think it also used to be a run, uh, he said a woman named Carolyn, um, she was either part owner or she was part of the uh, Mothman Festival that they do every year. Um, so stuff like that. But yeah, we, we had a great opportunity to talk to him. And inside this museum, I mean, there's like archives, there's handwritten police reports, there's newspaper clippings. I mean, it's amazing. So, but anywho, let's go ahead and take a listen to what Jeff had to say. So uh, we're here with uh, Jeff from the Mothman Museum. And uh, it, I don't know, you know, Jeff, uh, did this just come to you one day? You're like, you know, Point Pleasant needs a museum to remember Mothman, or, or was there? Well, not really. Uh, I opened a museum in 2006, but basically what had happened was is uh, there was a gentleman who was coming to the festival every year bringing movie props oh. from the movie, the yeah. Richard Gears movie, the mm -hmm. Mothman Prophecy. So every year he'd come to the festival set those props up so people could see them and things like that and it got to the point where he couldn't come every year and he called me one day on the phone and he said look um i'm going to donate these props to you and carolyn harris at the time she passed away about five years ago and um, donate those to you guys and you can use them at the festival yeah. well i thought you know there was there was a ton of props so I thought, you know, it'd be cool to have a museum because I've got all kinds of archives from where I'd collected. Yeah. You know, long story short, you know, our neighbors, when I was a five-year-old kid, were the, were the ones that seen it first. I was about, that was going to be my next yeah. question is if you had any and, ties. And I had already, you know, written a couple books, documentary-style books, and I thought, well, I've got enough stuff to just create a, a small museum, and then it's just grown into something yeah. bigger and bigger and bigger. But you know, we started off just in a small area, and then just like everything else, it grew. Yeah. But that's how that's how the uh, the fest or the museum started. So and the festival uh, came first. Festival was in 2003. Yeah. 2003. And the festival was again. Carolyn and I both mm -hmm. had businesses here on Main Street. We thought, you know, it'd be cool to have a little get together. We really, I think we called it a convention the first year. Yeah. Had about 500 people show up. Of course, this year we can't have it because of the COVID situation right, right. and stuff. But, Hang on you know, we're drawing, uh, but the festival's grown to 15,000 people. Oh, yeah. You know, this year. Like yeah, we were planning on Yeah, we had planned year. on coming. That's why we decided to just go ahead yeah. and come yeah. earlier. So, well, we're planning on next year already. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll be there. So we got, got a, few, <laughs> a few big surprises up our sleeves. So. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, I was just curious if, uh, you know, you mentioned you were five when everything kind of took place. Do you remember the hype of it all or you know, as a five-year-old? or As a five-year-old, you know, I remember, you know, my parents talking about it some. Uh, I don't, I wish I'd been a little older. Yeah. Now, I do remember more about when the Silver Bridge collapsed a year later. Yeah, of than, course. Than I did when right. Mothman stuff. But my dad worked up in the TNT area at the National Guard Armory. And, you know, when I was probably 14, 15, I remember my dad talking about you know, everybody up there yeah. looking for the bird, you know, the Mothman, whatever. So, but I, ha I I know a lot of people that were older than me yeah. that remembered a lot more about it and stuff. So, you know. Yeah, it was interesting. I talked to my dad. My dad was around 14 or 15. Yeah. And boy, yeah. and he was up in Michigan. Yeah, and yeah. he said, boy, I yeah. remember it. But he was always into, you know, sci-fi stuff and right, monsters yeah, and yeah. stuff. Growing up in the universal age, yeah. you know, like, well, so. You know, famous people. I mean, I, mm -hmm. my first book. Uh, we gave a copy to, to Gene Simmons, and yes. when he looked at the cover of the book, the first thing he says, "Did they catch it?" <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he knew about it. So, oh yeah, uh, I thought that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I would have to say, you know, you know, it's like you always hear like the top three cryptids. You hear, yeah. you know, is like Loch Ness monster, Bigfoot, Bigfoot and Mothman. Well, yeah, I mean, those are the three I always knew as a kid. Definitely propelled into pop culture now with yeah the, with the movie with, with, and the game. Yeah. You know, the, the Fallout '76. You know, the Fallout 76 features the museum in it. You know, yeah, that's what I heard, yeah. And uh, you couldn't ask for a better publicity. <laughs> you know, you know. Have you ever noticed when you're doing a podcast, all the noisiest cars and motorcycles? Yeah. Oh, every time. every time. Every time. Every uh, time. So I guess my question to you then is, as someone who runs all this stuff, um, how much of a believer are you? Not necessarily even in Mothman, but just in paranormal things. Because that's one thing we touch on is that they all seem to be kind of connected. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways well, to all the different stuff. In talking about the Mothman story, you know, I've talked to a lot of those original witnesses and stuff, 
and they had no reason really to make any of that up. Agreed. Yeah. And if it would have been just three or four people, teenagers, I would have been a little more skeptical. But I've sat down and talked to them in depth about what they saw, how it affected their lives and things. And I thought, well, why would somebody, you know, want to even come forward with all that information, you know? So there's no doubt in my mind that they saw something. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't just those four people in the car the first night. Yeah. There was a lot of prominent people, business people, teachers, elderly people that were seeing stuff. Yeah. That went to the police and told them about, hey, you know, we saw this thing. And some of them said it was a giant bird, but it was the biggest bird I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. yeah. Other people said this thing looked like a man with wings on it and stuff like that. Well, and then so, all the other things like John Keel talked about yeah. and Gray Bark talked about all yeah. the sightings of UFOs and everything. Yeah. And the thing I was going to ask is... How ironic, too, that a decade earlier we had the Flatwoods right. crash. I don't even like calling it the monster, but it was yeah. like the crash. Yeah, we had yeah. this red head and things yeah. like that, and then it disappeared. It's like, yeah. did it make its way over here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, are they, they one in the same? In the for 11 years. Are they one yeah. in the same? And I asked John Keel point blank, you know, before, you know, I, I had the privilege and the chance to meet with him and talk with him That's and stuff. Awesome. And I, I asked him, I said, do you think those people made that up? And he said, absolutely not. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. He, he actually, he never, ever poked fun or tried to poke any holes in the story or anything. He said, you know, they saw something. What it was, I don't think anybody will ever be able to really pinpoint. Yeah, yeah even even as jokey and goofy as, yeah. as Gray Barker was, he right, still right, very exactly. much believed yeah. it, too. I mean, yeah. he was just like, yeah. yeah. And we just... Um, we just had a big long interview with Alan Greenfield. Yeah. And, you know, and he confirmed a lot of that. Yeah. Big buddies with those guys. He's like, yeah, even then they were joking around. He's like, but Gray believed, believed it. it. Yeah. yeah. yeah 100%. Yeah. And John so. Keel did too. I never got a yeah. chance to meet Gray Barker, but, uh, you know, I asked John Keel, you know, point blank what his take was on it and stuff. You know, I, I think he was still puzzled by, you know, the yeah. whole thing. You know? Now, now the, I, I wonder if, you know, the stuff that, like, you know, this type of uh, uh, museum and other others like it mm -hmm. is like the more brick and mortar of the sideshow uh, carnival type oh, stuff sure, yeah. of the past, right? It's still right, it is. the wonder that you want to believe that there is something else. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's basically reality versus fantasy, you know. Because yeah. uh, you know what we do at the museum is we just present things for people to look right at, you know what i mean what you do with it yeah i'm not in the business to convince anybody of anything you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so, that's fine but uh you know people try to hold me in a corner once in a while in, in certain interviews and you know what do you think it was and i tell them i say you know i yeah. i'm like you i don't know yeah. yeah but i know for certain that they encountered something they saw something it affected well, their, their like lives. you said whether or not it was the 60s or now yeah people take a risk in yeah. coming forward with those types exactly. of stories. Exactly. Especially back then. Yeah, that especially was a, back then. That was a real conservative time. And, you know, you know, when they saw it that night, you know, they did not want to go to the police department. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they stopped at the local drive-in restaurant up there when they came back into town. And they were just going to tell the owner of the restaurant, because Linda had actually worked there as a waitress. Mm -hmm. His name was Gary Northup. And they, they went in and told him and he's the one that called the police department yeah. because he saw how upset they were. I talked to him on the phone one time mm -hmm. a few years ago, and I called him, and I said, I wanted to get your take on that whole evening, what, yeah. what the deal was. And he told me, he said, I was in my office getting ready to close about 11 o'clock, which jives with what Linda told me. I asked her what time they saw it, and yeah. she said about 11 o'clock. And she, he said, all of a sudden, I heard somebody pounding on the front doors and said it was them. And I, he said, I saw that they were upset. And I called the sheriff's department. Yeah, yeah. They were just afraid, and it, and it happened. Everybody made fun of them and said they were all crazy. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, and it's interesting because we were, um, we found some of uh, Alan's old uh, UFO sightings magazines from mm -hmm. the '60s that he had, and he was yeah. laughing about that. But in one of them, you know, he's talking about it. How at that time there was even a huge division in the ufology department, essentially right. versus sightings versus contactee sightings, right, right. and the contactee sightings were just made fun of and not taken seriously even by the ufo 
uh, community and then the community at large, like because since Roswell, people were kind of okay with right, UFO yeah. sightings, but anything that could be a monster or an alien or anything, that was still real, real taboo. Yeah, yeah. So for them to even come forward even more so, especially with the UFO sightings that had happened, yeah. it was super brave. Yeah. Yeah, Super the brave. '60s was was a different time. You know, you had Vietnam going on and the protests. And all oh that. yeah, and you just didn't walk into the sheriff's department right. and say, "Guess what we just yeah, saw." We saw know? this giant. Well, and then you got, yeah. and then on top of that, you got Woody Derenberger at the same time with right. his injured cold stuff. I mean, yeah. even more so. What a brave! And that it ruined all, it ruined his whole family. Yeah, you know, it did. so <laughs> yeah, yeah, they a lot of them just disowned him. Yeah. I still talk to his daughter from time to time. Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, I just finished her book yeah. last week. Yeah. So. You know, who knows? But yeah. I just don't think that, that, that the puzzle will ever be solved. Yeah. And I like that, though. Yeah, that's true. You know, I that's, that's the way I look at spirituality is the same way. It's like, I don't yeah. want to solve, I want to keep searching. Right, yeah. And, so. and, and if, if some of those original witnesses would even come forward today, you know, the other couple that was with them in the car still married and still live here in Point, and they admit that they saw it, but they won't do interviews, they won't talk, yeah. they won't talk about it. Yeah. But even if they held a press conference today and said, look, you know, we were just wanting attention, we, we just, you know, we, we made the whole story up. I think people would still, they'd be like, well, whatever. You, yeah. you say that, we'll, we'll believe it. Right. Well, that happened with the Allagash guys. Yeah. The right. Allagash abduction guys where um, one guy in the very end started yeah. saying it was all a hoax. Yeah. And so the other two guys were like, but no, it's yeah. not. Yeah. We did all this. And, right. you know, and then they claim, well, he was getting a book deal trying to bash oh, it. It's just this yeah. whole thing. It's like, yeah. but it's like anything like that. It's already hurt. Right. right. <laughs> right. We don't need it extra already, hurts. It already <laughs> affects credibility. Yeah. 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 Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking right, time yeah, with us, man. It. I'm and glad I didn't leave early. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you so much. I yeah. looked through my emails. We were at Biscuit World else for a while, man. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Well, good luck with everything. Yeah. Right. We're going to check out the museum okay. and store, man. We appreciate it. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you again, Jeff. Um, we appreciate you so much for taking the time. And like we said, he's got some really cool, great information there. Uh, so, make sure to check out uh, the Mothman Museum. And, uh, the, you know, if you remember Joe Purdue that we had on a few weeks mm -hmm. back, a lot of, his, you know, he does a lot of um, uh, figures and stuff. That's and, right. And all of those are available in the Moth Museum. So you, you not only you not only get to support the Mothman Museum and Point Pleasant and Jeff, but you pick one of those figures up. You yeah, Joe. you get to support Joe and uh, Ron over there at uh, Wild and Weird West Virginia. You know, Joe was on that um, episode we had a few weeks back about the Bigfoot sighting. Yep. Uh, but yeah, he was great because his stuff is also at the uh, Flatwoods Monster Museum as well. So yeah, he he makes some cool toys. And when we when we were talking to him uh, before we recorded yeah. that first time, he was showing us, showing us a bunch stuff. of new yeah. figures and stuff like that. I a mean, Yeti like, and a big. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna have um, we're gonna be sharing that out there if we haven't already to uh, to Wild and Weird West Virginia's uh, Etsy site with all their stuff. It's how they how they keep their crew going because they do also do investigations and they do a podcast and things like that. Yep. We, we love Ron and Joe. We love those guys. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think at this point, I think we need to get into our experience in Point Pleasant. If you guys are down. Yep. I just feel the need to give a shout out to the Piggly Wiggly for being oh, um, yeah. the uh, paranormal yeah. investigators, uh, true last stop shop. Yep. Yes. <laughs> when you, yes. When you need, um, when you need uh, uh, AAA batteries for your SP7 spirit box and, and only, zero calorie and zero monster calorie, drinks, yeah, zero <laughs> calorie monster drinks, which we had to have monster drinks when we're monster so hunting. That's right. Um, but yeah, uh, before we get into uh, creepy ketchup, I want to take a very quick ad break. Hey everyone, Josh here. Do you feel like mainstream options for things such as yoga, meditation, or documentaries and films meant to expand your mind are lacking? Have you heard of Gaia? Gaia is the largest resource of consciousness expanding videos. Both Stefan and I have watched several of the series, documentaries, and films available on topics such as the secret space program, channeling interdimensional beings, and alien encounters. We're just now exploring the over 8,000 films, shows, and classes available to stream on your favorite devices. To get your 10-day free trial of Gaia, go to fearscapepodcast.com slash Gaia offer. 
Again, that's fearscapepodcast.com slash G-A-I-A offer. All right, so like I said... Gosh, that was a good ad. It was. It's good. Get on Gaia. Um, but before... Uh, now you got me all messed up, Santosh. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, we had so much stuff happen, so uh, we're going to go straight into, essentially, like we said, an extended version of Creepy Ketchup. Creepy Ketchup. Creepy Ketchup. Creepy Ketchup. Creepy Ketchup. Y'all, it's creepy. All right, so yeah, so we got to go. We've been planning this forever to go to Point Pleasant. We had originally talked about going in April. Well, thank you, COVID-19. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen. And even then, we were hesitant right. um, about going this weekend. Though West Virginia um, has been one of the best. Is on it. Yeah, they, they are yeah. on it. I have done nothing but brag to people. I'm like, we were so safe because we also have at risk people. So none of us were going into this lightly, you know, mm-hmm. and, and casually. I just masks and, and that one dude getting kicked out of the gas station for not having one mm-hmm. on. Yeah. I was like, go West Virginia. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yeah. I was very impressed with that. Um, really liked that. Uh, they were the like I think one of the last states in the United States to, to report, even report yeah. a case. And I was going to stay in the union, but y'all made fun of me when I said that <laughs> in the car. Um, but no, we had a great road trip. Uh, we picked up Santosh along the way, and then uh, we stayed over in um, Gallipolis. Gallipolis. Keel pronounces it Gallipus. Gallipus. Um, we stayed over there across the bridge in Ohio. Um, because we wanted to stay at the Low Hotel, which is a pretty famous old hotel right across the street from the Mothman Museum, but it was closed or overbooked or uh, they um, were affected. Their family run. Uh, oh, hotel, that's right. That's and right. They were affected by COVID, and so they couldn't open. Man, it. we really wanted to stay there though because it's supposed to be super haunted as well. So we're yeah. not going to give you a shout out because we didn't get to stay. But I'll still give you a shout out. Nope, it's, it's a cool looking building no, on the outside. Cool. No, it is really, <laughs> it is really really cool. Um, but yeah, we had a blast and you know, it's funny is like, we really didn't know what we wanted to do. We knew we were going to go to Flatwoods. We knew we were going to go to, uh, the silver bridge, uh, monument. Um, and we knew that we would like to go up to where Woody Derenberger met injured cold. Um, and oh, we knew we wanted to go to the TNT, TNT. area, especially mm-hmm. after Joe's video. Um, we wanted to go up to the domes, but what happened was great and weird and scary and, and just, <laughs> I don't even know yeah. where to start. Like so I, we're still feeling oh, it. <laughs> I can tell you where we can start is my dream that I had the night bef- the two nights before we left, um, about Mothman and I was Lois Lane. <laughs> so I had this dream that, uh, <laughs> It was verbate it was like verbatim from the scene from Superman where Lois Lane is interviewing Superman out on her patio. Um, and uh, it, it is word for word for the most part, uh, except for instead of Superman, it's Mothman standing there. Um, and instead of Lois Lane, it's me in a Lois Lane wig in her outfit, the whole nine yards, because at one point I look in the mirror and I see myself in the wig, in the dress, <laughs> all the whole nine yards. And even the point, it's like, you have x-ray vision? What color underwear am I wearing? Ha <laughs> ha. And Mothman's like, blah, 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 pink. Blah. And uh, then, of course, the love theme starts, and he's like, would you like to go for a ride? Blah. And so he picks me up, and we fly in the air. It's the whole thing where we're holding hands, and it's like, woo. And, like, the soft music goes, and, like, in the in the movie where she's like, in her head, she's thinking, can you read my mind? Um, I said that in my mind, and then I hear, yes, idiot, I told you we were telepathic. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I get dropped, and I'm like, ah! And then Mothman grabs me and laughs, and then we fly more together. It was really awkward. And in and case anybody's wondering, uh, this is the Christopher Reeves. Yeah, Superman. the Christopher Reeves Superman. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was the dream I had two nights before, so I already knew this was going to be epic. So. <laughs> well, so we were going Mothman hunting. Well, and then that morning, uh, you know, we're, we're get up and uh, get, oh, my, yeah. get my kids out of the door. We're packing up. And you've got uh, a couple of those camping chairs. Mm-hmm. You got two. And I said, well, I got another one. So I'll go to grab it. And I go to get the cover to put on it. And there's 
a uh, a woolly worm, right? I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know what they're actually called, but that's what I always call worms. <laughs> uh, and it's going into like a uh, cocoon stage to turn into a moth, moth. or a man. Well, I, probably not a man. It's- <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was fortuitous as well as the fog. That oh, fog yeah. that morning was insane. Was so dense. I mean, like, you- we couldn't see barely in front of us. Um, and I just, again, thought that was very ominous. And it was, uh, it was like start the trip. dense fog well into the morning. You know, yeah. usually the sun burns that stuff off, but it was dense Yeah, I mean, fog. we drove for quite a while before we got out of the fog. Um, so. Which, not to be confused with the fog. The movie, the John Carpenter movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we, we get there and we get all settled in and, and stuff like that. And uh, we, I think we just decided we were going to, um, what, what did we do first? So first we went out, I thought it would be a good idea to go to the TNT area during the day. Right, that's right. Mm-hmm. So we knew where we were going. So when we went back at night, we weren't stumbling around in the dark. Right, and so already we're super nervous because we're like, God, we're going to get arrested. Because <laughs> I think we said it, it's a wildlife preserve now. Um, you can go there. Um, you're not really supposed to. Um, but at the same time, they don't really enforce it either. Yeah, as long as you're not out there shooting things or, or blowing fireworks up or something yeah, like that. Cause they know people are going to go yeah. out there. And so you had uh, talked to Joe and kind of got us a layout of the best spots to go. And because most of these domes are still closed. Well, actually I, I just did some research. Oh, I thought you got it from Joe. No, I just did a lot of research leading up to the trip. To, Joe's to, my Google. Okay. So. <laughs> He's my West Virginia Google. But yeah, I just did a lot of research and actually found where someone had written some instructions on how to get there. So I'd, you know, pulled it up on Google Maps before we went and actually marked it as a place so that I could get back to it if we needed to. And yeah, so, you know, I'm a preparation kind of guy. Yeah, it was fun, though. We did a little hike in and uh, there were two trails. We could have gone either way. We decided to take the path less taken um, and went down there. And the very first dome that we got to was open. And I, and I assume it's because that's the one probably people go to the most. Um, but yeah, we went in there and the thing that was unexpected um, for me was the echo chamber that it was so we get in there it is legit a cement dome um pretty clean like i mean there were definitely idiots that had thrown away garbage and there's definitely um graffiti graffiti uh but it was it was pretty clean i mean we only saw like two bottles in there for the most part and uh it was incredible and so we started just like making noises and singing and doing stuff like that when we realized that we needed to do more singing and we needed to do more chanting. Um, and at that point, we had decided we were going to, which, by the way, uh, this is the world premiere uh, announcement that we will be uh, creating an album that's already created uh, called Dome Chants. Um, cause we did indeed dome chance, dome chance. create some dome chants and we'll talk about that when we get to the second night, but there are one or two from the ones while we were in there. Uh, cause Josh, you also had your 360 cam going. Yep. So we had that going. Plus I recorded a, co- a little bit of video and some audio of us singing and just messing around and having fun because I mean, I've never heard acoustics like this. And we even counted at one point, didn't we Santosh to see how long the yeah. echo lasted. And it was like 27 seconds. After you made a sound, it mm-hmm. went 27 seconds. That's how long in this tiny space. Like, geez, Louise. And just, uh, just to you know, to throw a little nu- numerology at you, two plus seven is nine. nine. Yep. Oh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me just tell you, Alan Greenfield. Thank you, uh, because all we did the whole <laughs> week <laughs> is, is punch numbers and words into the, the cipher, cipher yeah. and like <laughs> knock wor- like numbers down to their like single yeah. digit. <laughs> and uh, we were looking for everything green. Um, and just- and we, we, passed, we passed a bunch of a bunch of businesses that were Alan. Yeah, or AG. Or AG. <laughs> <laughs> it was everywhere, man. Um, but yeah, we had a blast in there. And, you know, we're looking around because there were definitely some sightings that took place at the domes of the Mothman. And I was like, yeah, he could have hidden in one of these. Um, you know, there was definitely, though, if he moved, I mean, you even like moved an inch. Yeah. It was like, pukew, pukew, pukew. Yeah. just when we, we actually got some track of us whispering and you could still just mm-hmm. hear it echoing everywhere so yeah i i really enjoyed that that was one of my favorite parts of the whole trip just having fun like because i think we didn't know what to expect and it's really kind of the first time any of us had really been out and about especially together since covid and so it was really great to just kind of let loose 
a little bit and yeah. we didn't there was no one else around um so it was really cool we were pretty much there by ourselves um and it, it was really beautiful i mean because this wildlife preserve is there so these yeah. all these like ponds and swamps swampy and just, area and stuff there were cranes everywhere yeah. but not not sand hill cranes mm -hmm. uh but lots you of say birds, sand -tosh cranes sand -tosh cranes sand -tosh everywhere cranes, what? <laughs> and we're like y'all do do crocodiles and alligators get up here <laughs> <laughs> but you know so so i think that um all in all, I mean, the, the first going out there, like you said, was just more of exploratory. Then on the way back, we got um, pizza at this really cool little pizza place. Oh, yeah, place. the village the village pizza. Yeah. That was really good right there in Point Pleasant. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, uh, on Keith Age's uh, on Keith Age's recommendation, we did stop at oh, yeah. Hillbilly Hot Dog on the way before down. we yeah. got to the uh, hotel, by the way, which was really good. And I think Santosh got the Mothman I hot did. Dog. I was just about to say I got the Mothman dog, and it was far superior to their other recommendations. Yeah, to the, <laughs> the Hillbilly Hot Dog, which is what Josh and I both got. Which is basically a chili dog. <laughs> yeah, basically a chili dog. But, man, it was still really good. All the hot dogs are deep fried, and, man, you're going to walk away with a heart attack. Uh, it's great. It was perfect. Yep. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, we had a good time and there, and uh, yeah, the pizza, the village pizza, they even had a Mothman pizza. I mean, obviously, Point Pleasant has accepted Capitalized. that. Yeah, and capitalized. Unlike Parkersburg, Parkersburg has not, or Mineral, Mineral Wells has not capitalized on the injured cold stuff. But right. boy, yeah. oh boy. You know, you would expect to find an injured cold stone creamery or <laughs> uh, <laughs> Woody Darren Burgers, where you can get the best Darren Burger in town. <laughs> oh, Lord. 76 woody and lumber yeah I mean, it's like i get i get you yeah nothing nothing nothing, nothing at all um but yeah they they really everywhere we went i mean when we went to the um the coffee shop next to the mothman museum i mean they had a mothman cookie mothman drink all kinds of stuff like that yeah, mothman yeah, pizza we did see one of those yeah that's yeah. what i'm saying at village pizza yeah it was really good um we didn't get the mothman pizza but we saw uh, the table next to us did and it was really interesting because everywhere we went there were definitely like mothman hunters um there were always oh, yeah. people talking about like what they saw or what they were doing or where they were going next and things like that uh and so i was actually quite surprised that we didn't run into more people out at the TNT area, which is a pretty big hot spot. So, so anyway, so yeah, we, we got done eating pizza and we decided to um, head back to the hotel just to kind of relax for a little bit, yep. um, you know, and uh, get showers, uh, just all that stuff because we had planned on heading out to uh, Tay. Oh, I'm going to no. really mess this up. Yeah. I don't Tay know. It's, it's the park that's at the corner where the two rivers come together. Oh, right? the chief's name. Yeah, yeah Te, Te, Wei, uh, Te Wei or something like that. Yeah. I'm so sorry. But it's a park now. It's where the big monument is, where the Battle of Point yeah. Pleasant happened. And it's actually where we thought was the Silver Bridge at first. Um, and Based on your in, in inaccurate... Well, based on <laughs> my description of Gray Barker's description of the bridge, I, I thought he meant literally, not like kind of because he basically said it, it went over where the uh the two rivers meet and it didn't it's like half a mile down um but <laughs> well and, you know yeah so we we'd gone over and we decided to do um uh, i guess some like some esta sessions there mm -hmm. and you know we picked at a really good spot <clears> and then you're like let's walk down to the wharf and so we wasted a lot of time doing that it was not a waste i wish someone <laughs> would have told us not to go <laughs> I, I do too. I wish somebody had just been like, guys, no, no, guys, stop, no. If I, I just somebody had complained it. every five feet about well, it, the, I the wish cool somebody thing could have turned us around. The river walk was really pretty. They have all these paintings everywhere, all these incredible statues um, made by the same person that made the Mothman statue. Also, uh, don't shine a laser pointer on a metal statue. <laughs> Yeah, a no, shiny metal don't stage. don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're at this park, which you know, which is where there's also that old mansion that's there. I think it's called Mission Inn or something like that. Is that a mansion? It's a log cabin. Well, they referred to it as the mansion. Oh. Um, so maybe back in. Wait, the you mean the old tavern? Yeah. Yeah, it, it eventually got turned into a house, and they called it the mansion for a while. I was reading mansion. the history thing on it. Uh, but, yeah, so anyways, not only that, there's lots of graves all over this place. Water so Panther like, Rock is there. Yeah, Water Panther. There's Chief Cornstalk, who, you know, um, which we didn't really talk about in the Mothman thing, but there's theory that Chief Cornstalk <clears throat> cursed Point Pleasant 
uh, during one of the battles when they had like because the, the the people of Point Pleasant had lied to him and uh, still ended up even after the peace treaty like killed him and and things like that and so he supposedly cursed the town and it's like 200 years supposedly from the date is when the Mothman sightings happened and Silver Bridge and all of that stuff so there's also that well but you found evidence from somebody that heard, that said that that was right from a, a PBS show called Monstrum I believe I can't remember her name off the hand but she said she had found some documents that showed the first uh, mention of the curse came from a uh, play an elementary school play that took place, I don't know, like late 1800s, where a teacher had written that in as part of the uh, history of the town play, and that it kind of became common to say that. Yeah. So I don't know, but anyways, yeah. So you got Chief Cornstalk. His his grave is there, and he's a pretty famous uh, Native American chief. He's there. A bunch of soldiers from the Revolutionary War, from yeah. War of 1812, and all sorts of different things. They're all Plus, buried there. All the people who either as part of the Silver Bridge or just in general have probably passed away in the river. Yeah. So we had, we had some really interesting things happen. I mean, we waited till pretty late. I mean, this was like maybe 10 30, 11 before yeah. we even got out there and uh, we set up some chairs and we were, we decided all of us were going to do um, Estes sessions. <sighs> and there was some really interesting things that have happened and I'll yeah. let you get into that. So um, yeah. So, so the, I'm trying to remember, did I go first? Uh, I think it was me. You. No, I think no, I, went I, went, first. I went last. I went yeah, last I went yet. first. So you went first. So, so yeah. So during your session, we got a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, I, I don't. There was only a couple of things that I could think of off the top of my head that I want to call attention to. Uh, one is at one point in time, I think we were talking with someone who uh, may have uh, been on the Silver Bridge when it went uh, mm -hmm. when it would collapsed. Um, and then at another point in time, you were, uh, it seemed like you were talking to something else. Well, it and sounded like he, during his, a conversation was going on around yeah, him. Yeah. Like you were almost like pick, yeah, you were picking up bits and pieces of other people's conversations and relaying those things. That right. was the look up though, that when you saw. Yeah. Phenomenon. So yeah. at one point I apparently said, look up. Yeah. So you said, look up. I, of course, every, I always do whenever we've done them in my backyard mm -hmm. and everything. I always look up. So I look up in like, I don't know, seconds after I look up, I see the shooting star. Uh, I'm trying to think what direction it would have been going in. It would have been going like, um, like uh, north, no, like south west to northeast right so i see the shooting car star go across i'm like oh crap there's a shooting star and um and then um so then your time was up because we usually don't go that long because well i wanted to mention something too uh two things one uh the comet that's been around was out but we we couldn't, we couldn't see, see it. it but it was out um I, and i i hope that, that makes reference later but it's like the other thing is is that something has been happening the last couple times we've been estes sessions i've been channeling yeah um and i've channeled before but the, they seemed to have been happening um accidentally during these estes sessions right. and things like we that just kind of peaked the through. first one happened on our ufo sighting at waverly yep. uh park um and things like that and so it's been showing up and and i i channeled a little bit there um and so, uh, but yeah, then Santosh went, oh, in between Santosh's yes. and mine, the, the UFO is Remember, we had said yeah. we were skipping our UFO sighting because we, right. all three of us saw this, yeah. uh, UFO sighting that was remarkable and strangely similar to the video we posted two weeks ago. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we were like transitioning between, uh, Estes participants and, like I always do, you know, I always just kind of watch this guy and to see, you know, what we're going to see. Well, <clears throat> I picked up movement. You know, it was way, way up there. I mean, it was mm -hmm. like really, really far up there. And so uh, based on what we were seeing, I decided it's probably on an airplane, but I didn't hit it directly. So you have, you have that green laser pointer. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So I shined it up there. I didn't really, like, I wasn't shining it at it. I was just shining it in the right. vicinity. Which, remember, PSA, please do not do shine that. lasers at airplanes. airplanes. Right. Um, we try not to shine it actually at anything that is moving just in case, but we will shine near it. Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of <laughs> moving it around the area. And what does it do? It flashes back. Flashes back. Brightly. Every single time it yep. flashes back. Santosh saw this. We saw this. Different different gradations of brightness as well. Yes. So the yeah. first one was really bright, then the next one was kind of low, and they weren't 
they weren't like regular like you would think like a, a like a and it was yellow yeah. i remember that or i perceived it as, as yellowish um and it would um it wasn't like like a b b b yeah it wasn't flash, in rhythm. flash flash no it wasn't yeah it was only it was doing regular it when we, we would <laughs> flash the, the shoot the uh, the laser pointer near i mean we're watching this this is going for a while so, to mean, the point that zantosh is like i've seen it i give up before <laughs> the best part <laughs> so, you know just to kind of put it in this as a context so from our viewpoint the light moving in the sky resembled was not because we checked it, but resembled about the size of what you see when the International Space Station flies over. I even thought it might have been a little bit bigger. Than might that. be a little bit like, bigger, like, but like I, one I of thought, the planets. I thought in the bigger sky. from videos I've seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it seemed to me more like the size of like Jupiter in the sky. Okay, like, it seemed pretty decent but, size. <clears throat> but when it was moving, uh, the light that flashed back was much brighter. Much brighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much brighter. And then when Santosh pushes his head down. That's when it starts moving erratically. Yeah. So like it was like evading. Yeah, it all of a sudden goes from flashing back at us to dodging our lights. Like yeah. like it's either mad at us or playing with us. But I mean, it's moving like in odd directions. It's no longer yeah. moving this linear path, which would say satellite or um, airplane. Which of course, then I start to think about. What if the me- what if the shooting star that I saw was actually that craft entering the atmosphere? Oh, I didn't even think of. Well, my whole point was, what if it was there to look at the comet, right? Yeah. So yeah, both the two things combined. Possibly, I didn't even think about that um, because we did see another UFO uh, while I think Santosh was under. Um, we saw a small one. Um, yeah, moving moving from like west to east yeah. across the sky and the interesting thing about and a both flock of, these, of geese and a barge everything went on yeah. and i was blindfolded <laughs> but shit. the interesting thing about <laughs> both of these uap sightings was that soon after we saw an airplane fo- in the same direction yeah. coming like coming in the direction that it was going as well almost oh, as if it was looking, following looking it. like it was pursuing yeah pursuing yeah. it yeah like not long after at all and it's like and there was that point where you're like yeah that's an airplane yeah. like you can hear it you right. can see the blinking lights blinking like light. yeah it was red flashing lights on the one. It, and, and both I'm, of these uaps that it happened that immediately behind it was an airplane like sometime yeah. like behind it yeah so excuse me there is a uh, a municipal airport <clears throat> You know, endpoint, or actually, I think it's yeah, not those planes would not go up no, that high. That, no. not, it's a small local community airport. There's no way that an airplane would go that high. Only military aircrafts are going to go that high, and that's what tells me it, the Air Force was pursuing something. Yeah. So, um, so then we 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 transition to um, Sayatosh doing mm-hmm. an Estes. <clears throat> and Sayatosh, this was your first attempt at an Estes. Right? My cherry pop and Estes session it sure was. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and that's about as exciting as it was. I was mad, <laughs> but I'd never well, done it before. Well, yeah, you know. Well, we had some technical difficulties too with the um, AM, FM. Yeah, the AM, FM. And oh, no, no, we, no. That was at the domes. Well, we did a little bit there too because uh, we had to fix the speed and some things like that on it because we were actually using the box as opposed to the app. Yeah. Um, so. Well, you know, some people like it hard. Some people <laughs> like it soft. Some people like it fast. Some people like it slow. Some Santosh people feel like it. a nut. Some people don't. <laughs> Santosh likes it at a medium pace. Yeah. Well, we also this whole time have two dudes who are totally drunk hanging out at the mansion just watching us. And I guess while I was under, like one dude threw up all over the place. No, so. as soon as you started, as soon as your session was over, brought you out, the other guy was retching on oh. the ground. It was it was phenomenal. I was like, what? <laughs> so, but yeah, we had some, e- even through, um, you know, your nervousness and things like that, we still had some really interesting things. Again, things that felt like people that were, uh, that had passed on, like these spirits yeah. that are contacting that had passed on through the silver bridge um, and things like that. Uh, some very interesting stuff. And even with yours, we had some very interesting now, stuff, Josh. I'll, you'll have to talk about mine because I was not like, but yeah, Santosh's was hilarious though because uh, yeah, we had geese coming by. But one thing that happened was is I was trying to freaking um, night geese. I was trying to take a look, and Santosh looked really really cool. So I was recording with my phone, and I decided I wanted to take a picture. Well, I didn't realize I had the flash on, and so it flashes, and Santosh is like, "There's a light! <laughs> There's a light!" Well, and then and then later this big barge 
because you know it's it's midnight and so this big barge is coming down the river and it's shining its big spotlights everywhere trying to make sure there's you know not stuff in the in the river we don't see the barge at first we just see this light light. shining down and santosh says something about explore the light yeah and we're like oh my god I i think you said something about like under the bridge and at that point in time, this huge spotlight hits underneath the hits bridge. Hits underneath the bridge. And we're like, oh, my goodness, it's a Mylar balloon situation. Yeah, we can't, <laughs> we can't see the barge anywhere yet because it's so far down. And it also looks like it, when we do see the barge, we're like, there's no way that it would bend the way yeah. that it – but it, it was. Yeah. It was the barge. Was but then, the, yeah, as it gets closer, that light's then hitting Santosh again. He's like, I'm seeing lights nice. again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm standing, like, in, in the way between the light and Santosh, so I don't – you know, he's not, you know, freaking out because the light hit him in the face. Of course, you know, you're nervous a little bit, so you're kind of talking yourself through things or whatever, and it's like, we're having trouble even paying attention to you because this bar just like... (laughs) (laughs) As well as these geese are like... Like this, I mean, it was the most chaotic... I mean, I don't even think we asked you, but that makes me feel better because, you know, like I was jealous. You all had some really good ones over the weekend and mine felt lame when I was in Uh, there because your conscious mind is so judgy while you're doing it. I think we maybe asked you two questions. (laughs) Well, at one point it sounded like you all wouldn't shut up. And then I understand now why it's because there was absolute chaos going on around. I'm just sitting there blindfolded, noise canceling, you know, like over top of the, Mm -hmm. of the thing. And now that I think about it, that's probably why the geese came flying by is because the oh, barge. Oh, yeah, was barge, coming. Um, no, was coming. I think we've gotten to the real bottom of it, and those were MF and Sandhill cranes yeah. coming by, bringing <laughs> those chaos. Were, those was so all nobody mops. gets any real research done. It was Sandhill cranes. That's exactly what it was. Um, Pretending my memory- to be geese. When without in listening, without listening to the sessions, Josh, I I don't have the memory that you do, but yeah, I mean, even in yours, we had some interesting stuff well, happen. You you said at one point in time, I remember when I came out of it. You said at one point in time that you all thought that you might have been talking to Indrid Cole. Yeah, that did oh, happen. Yeah, oh, that was we, the boyfriend one, Steve. Yeah, Steve and we boyfriend. were. Oh, Steve, the boyfriend. I, Actually, I, it was brother. Whatever. Um, <laughs> I want to come back to that in one second. I watched too much Supernatural. We did also try to use Keith's. Um, uh, night vision camera and it died during mine sure. it died at, the end of the at, at mine which I want to talk no it happened both times yeah. that right. I did an Estes session the camera died I just wanted to point that out oh. um, but it died and I don't think we switched batteries we didn't so we didn't get footage but we do have audio, audio of mine. everything yeah. but yeah there was one point you yeah we assumed you were injured cold because one of the new things that we're um, seeing is on the hellier uh, fan based uh, Facebook group thing um, someone had pointed out that Tanya Derenberger has a blog um, which only has like two posts but in it she is now claiming after Hellier that Indrid is not dead but is indeed still alive because if you watched Hellier she says that Indrid uh, that Carl and uh, Indrid's kids came and said oh Indrid's dead he died in a crash right, he yeah. was being chased or, or while he was trying to do something or other um, but she said now that he's he's shown up in her room and his he's like got burn scars and things like that and said that he had to hide um, and that he is still hiding out um, she doesn't have any more information than that so we kind of knew this going into that um, that there's this which I never thought injured was dead anyways if he is no I mean I, alive. I think when we I think when we even saw that as part of Hellier we immediately said what if he just faked his own yeah death? what if he faked his own death right. and well mm-hmm. and a lot of that kind of showed up here is that it, it did feel like that it was injured cold and he had talked about how he missed his partner very very much Steve he called him Steve and he said brother yeah he said brother um and that he loved him so much and that uh he was buried on another world um because it's i'm pretty sure he said he was dead steve was well he dead. said he was gone he was gone i assumed he meant dead but like and was on another world and he couldn't get to him especially because he is hiding right now so this like spurned a lot of theories throughout the entire weekend um, about the connection between injured cold and Mothman. You know, this yep. idea of what if Mothman was a bounty hunter uh, after injured cold or what if injured cold was Mothman and was a bounty hunter or um, he did something. He took the side <laughs> of humanity. And then, you know, at one point in time, I think we even said, what if Terry wrist, Terry wrist was the bounty was hunter, the bounty hunter. What if Alan Greenfield was injured? I mean, everybody What if Santosh was a sandhill crane. I mean, <laughs> 
<laughs> everything. Never. But yeah, and so that was very, very interesting. And he did. He seemed very, very melancholy, um, just wanting to say that he missed his friend, um, but insinuating that he was still here. Um, we, we also, um, in, I think in Santosh's, that's when we first got the reference to embers, the three embers. I'm, I'm thinking now about something else that you had happen in your session at the point and that is uh, the blue face with the red eyes. Oh my oh. goodness, I forgot about that. Yeah, um, so much has happened this weekend. <laughs> but yeah, during I my- I thought you were, oh God. Oh, uh, that's okay. Especially during the accidental channeling, I kept seeing this face and I had said that it reminded me of Admiral Thrawn from yeah. uh, Star Wars Rebels and things like that. And I wrote it off because my car I've named Admiral Thrawn and things like that. And I'm like, oh, maybe it's just in my head, but it didn't look like any image of Thrawn besides the blue skin had these deep glowing red eyes and black hair. Um, and it just, it kept getting closer and closer. And it would go away. And it would go away. And yeah, and then it would like, and it seemed to happen after I would channel, I would then see this. And then at one point it was like right on my face. And it's like, um, and at one point you guys scared me because you, you guys set my phone down or something. Um, and I was like, Oh my God, I, I feel something. But then I felt something again later. I felt something run down my arm, like a hand rush down my arm and scratch it down. Um, right around the same time I was seeing the face. Um, and it scared me. It didn't feel like a good face. It just seemed really frightening to me. Intimidating is is the better word. Well, and and, and I don't know. I don't, I don't think I may have not told you all this, but I think I had a dream later on that night uh, where I saw a, a blue face, and I and I described what I had seen, and you said that was similar to what you had seen. Mm-hmm. Mine was like a big headed. Like almost like the, like that picture I've drawn for you guys that has yeah. like the real high cranial ridge mm-hmm. and and stuff like that, but it was blue. Yeah, so weird, so really, really strange to happen. Um, but yeah, what a very, very interesting night. So that was night first was. night. Yeah, that was just night one. <laughs> night two, Saturday night. Uh, well, Saturday during the day is when we went to Flatwoods, which we, yeah. you know, you listened to last week's episode, you know all about that. But on the way, we also stopped at um, the roadside. Um, you know, there's no exact spot, um, but where Woody Derenberger, um was essentially stopped by injured cold. And so we pull over and I pulled pretty fast because we were like, ah, I think this yeah. is pretty good. And we look and not not even more than eight feet from us is this deer. Yeah. Just gorgeous deer just it's just standing staring there staring, there staring at, at us. us i mean and i slid off the side of the road i mean this thing didn't move we rolled the windows down we got pictures of it and it just looked at us i mean it was there for probably what two three minutes i mean i think we even got out of the mm-hmm. car at one point in time and it just stood there and looked at us and then it just casually yeah casually walked, walked. went off and i think santosh went up there we were like is it telling us to follow it mm-hmm. but there wasn't really mm-hmm. anything but woods back there <laughs> and the flatwoods monster yeah, and the Flywoods monster. <laughs> but yeah, we hung out there. That was pretty neat, um, kind of experiencing that. There was definitely an indentation, but you can also see there was buildup from where they um, widened, widened the, the road, road yeah. and so things like that. So it definitely was not the same topography, um, but we knew we were generally in the right spot. Um, that was fun. And to me, I think there should have been a historical marker there, but it's the highway. So I also get that. You don't want people, you know, stopping, stopping on the side of the road. Well, I mean, you could do a little pull off, right? <laughs> Doing what we did. Yeah. Doing what we did, yeah. <laughs> That's why the deer didn't care because it sees it every five minutes. Well, and also don't forget the night before after the point uh, right. or at some point we just decide to go driving and we drive past the TNT area yeah. and we uh, and I wanted to say this before we get into what happened on Saturday is we decided to just pull off the side of the road because we we're like, it's dark. The sky was crystal clear and we were like, I want to see so many stars. And so uh, <laughs> we go, we go over there, we pull off, we <laughs> There's this truck sitting on side road. So this whole time, there's a dude sleeping in this truck. I don't know if he knew we were there or not, uh, but we were probably six or seven car lengths in front of him, uh, pulled off. And uh, we've got, not only do we have the laser pointer out, we've got the thermal cam going and some things like that. Well, at one point, Santos, you like shoot the laser pointer into the woods and it like makes this like noise like something's running it spooks something back there but it runs towards us that's yeah. what got me yeah it ran towards tell it that us. way we're, we're <laughs> multiple like, yeah. time it so wasn't get- just one side there i was like Ooh! and then i did it again and then that's when yes my chicken boo 
but like got like <laughs> grabbed the door and started to get back in the car. <laughs> but, um, that's also because you all, both of you, were on the other side, so we was... were already scared. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, and then I, it did it again after that, right? Even yeah. after I shut the door yeah. and shined it, it made one more noise, and that's when I ran around and, and joined yeah. you all on the other side of the car. Well, and, and uh, I did some thermal of the woods, and there was some heat spots, but I think it was all like trees and stuff. Yeah, like we that. didn't really catch anything, but yeah, there were some interesting knocks as well. Well, you did the, you yeah, did like the. I made my own noise. I went like, like that. that, and it like within a second like responded back and it was not an echo because i tried to do it again yeah. mm -hmm. but it was that very very interesting tree knock that some people say they hear with sasquatch and stuff like yeah. that so i don't know it was interesting and scary and nerve-wracking and cool because god you could see the milky way i mean it was yeah. just it was an amazing night view for but sure. we were surprised that uh after everything we saw we didn't see anything while we were out there yeah so, but yeah, oh, we went yeah. home, like I said. But yeah, that was kind of fun. Just pitch black dark yeah, out we there. The oh, hotel. we did hear somebody get murdered, though. Did anybody oh, I that? forgot about that. Yeah, at one point we hear, like, there was, like, a small little town or something or just a couple houses down. And, yeah, we hear this blood curdle scream. And we're like, we should probably go. Go. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we took off. But, yeah, so the next day after after uh, Indrid stuff, um, we, we wanted to go back cause we had plans to go back to the TNT domes at night. Cause we didn't go the night before we were too tired. That's why we just drove down the road a little bit. Um, but yeah, we went to the TNT domes, but we, we wanted to make some dome chants. That was like yeah. what we wanted to do. We also wanted to maybe do a little ritual, um, you know, a little pagany goodness because one of the domes that we went into just felt really good. Cause we went into two different domes. The second dome, which was the third dome, on the path that has four. Which dome? Uh, the third one. <laughs> the second was, dome, which was the third dome third, of the four so domes. There's four domes. But the first, the first one. one was open. The second one was closed. The third one was open. The fourth one was buried in mud. So <laughs> the second one we went into, it, it had a weird vibe. We were even kind of nervous about going into it, even during the day. So uh, when we we had decided we were going to take gear. We knew that we wanted to do an Estes session um, for all of us in the dome, though it was going to be echoey as hell. Um, we wanted to do it. Plus we wanted to do some dome chants, plus a little ritual um, and just take some thermal and night vision and all of that goodness. Uh, we met Santosh's boyfriends along the way. Yes, they're adorable. Um, sorry if you're listening uh, and you're not okay with that. But yeah, Lucas <laughs> and <too> Nick. <laughs> Lucas and Nick, shout out. Um, we met them on the road, and uh, you know we asked them, "Hey, we're gonna take, we're gonna do uh, dome number one," uh, and they ended up coming back a little bit later because they heard us singing. And uh, they came in and joined in with us on two songs, like sang with us and um, did some chanting. We were doing pagan chants at that point. Uh, and it was really, really cool. And then they took off. We did a bunch of different chants and songs chants. And, chants and songs and stuff. You channeling like that. again? And a little like your channel channeling. Voice. Um, but yeah, then we decided to do the ESTA sessions completely in the freaking dark with the only light being the light from the back end of the night vision camera and the light from the thermal. Yep. Um, we had set up the thermal cam to uh, point outside the door, which our, I still our think... Our only protection, by the way. Our only a protection. thermal cam at the only entrance and exit from and there this was a, concrete there was little, dome tomb. There was a little cauldron somebody could have stepped like tripped on oh they could have tripped over my cauldron you're right yep. so two, <laughs> I, mean, things. I mean i tripped Practical on witchcraft leaving. right there <laughs> but yeah i wanted sucker. i wanted to um you know we wanted to get that just in case something came to the door though uh in hindsight i think we should have had the thermal on us towards the door as well but whatever um so we do these essa sessions which means we can't ask questions because if we ask questions it's going to echo too much so we decided we were just going to free form it and let the person uh, in the estes session just speak what they they're feeling speak whatever they're saying um and go for broke and so, uh, Josh, you went first on this I one. I went first, uh, and we tuned to an FM, the FM side of the stations, and we're in a big concrete dome covered in mud and trees. And of course, FM doesn't pick up very well. No. And I didn't. I didn't even think about switching to AM, you know, through the session or yeah. anything. So, so yours was slow and patchy. Yeah, but I, I will say that you know, having gone back and listened and and consolidated mine down to you know the, the parts where I say things. Um, I definitely feel like that I was picking up a two person conversation or two entity conversation and I was relaying half of that conversation. 
Yeah. Because there was like, you know, they, they it would say something like, oh, we've been getting on. Yeah, you got to keep going. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what you got to do. You know, that well, well, here's the deal. Take it or leave it. You know, and then like a few seconds later, it'd be like, well, you can't have it both ways. And it was like <laughs> it was like it was having a conversation. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, and for Santosh and I, it was frightening as all get out because we're in the dark. We can't talk. The only thing mm-hmm. keeping us going is the thermal light. Um, even me, that scared me because I was like, I don't want to see, see something. In it. Um, though I did, I couldn't stop staring at it. I was so freaking terrified. Yeah. And shout out to prescription meds because I was like, damn, Amen. these meds are good because I am terrified right now. <laughs> like. like <laughs> and I was cool with it. Yeah, it was it was tough. Um, but then we get to my session, which you know we had told you I'd been channeling. Well, I decided I wanted to channel, um, and so um, I I decided to kind of meditate right before and kind of get myself in the zone and allow the channel to come through a lot more. But I what I didn't expect was to go so deep I lost myself. Yeah. So um, I mean, it kind of scared me <clears throat> looking back on it. And I mean, um you, you started out, uh, I would say, you know, having having done some sessions with you where you channel in the past, mm-hmm. I, I could definitely de- de- you know determine where the channel starts. And so you started out just kind of general saying things that more of a ecstasy type session would, would bring. And then, you know, it switches to right at the moment where it says, I know you, I've seen these eyes, these eyes have changed. At that point in time, that's when it shifts into more of a channel. And from that point forward, it was 20 minutes of just crazy, (laughs) crazy stuff. Right. And of course, my channel voice is a creepy, scary voice, though the person itself wasn't scary though to me again it felt like a very terry wrist type person mm. um, but yeah there was even a point you said I, it's like i pinched my wrist and yeah. went so, into it so you like you know and, and going into the to the when you started you said like three just nonsensical words random words like like uh um you know corn stock like woman tv sorry bad joke <laughs> uh, well, tanks like, like no you like you said <laughs> two of the words were Oh, there was there was twenty crowns, a uh, bulldozer, bulldozer was one, wasn't it? And then battlefield. battlefield and then after close. you said battlefield, you like you reached over with your left hand and you pinched your right hand on like the wrist, and then from that point, like like seconds later, you were channeling. Which of course you don't see this until you're watching the night the, vision. Yeah, the night vision. Um, and yeah, it really creeped me out. And um, I'm gonna play a little clip here of it just for everybody to see. Hello again. You don't even know the time has passed. There's better things to worry about. I want to speak to you. I was told by someone to find you. Okay, so you can see, well, not see, but hear Here. Um, how creepy that is. And we'll see some of that footage in the eventual documentary that we make. Um, but yeah, it really scared me too, because I don't remember any of this. Um, it, I got really, I definitely went into trance mode um, and really kind of lost myself. Um, and at one point, we, uh, at one point, the camera dies, of yeah. course, right before the person that, and if you don't know what channeling is, it's essentially using your body as a vessel for a spirit to speak through, essentially. Yeah. Um, Think Whoopi Goldberg in the movie yeah. Ghost. Um, but yeah, it's like, yeah, the, the <laughs> camera died, and it's like, 
I, I'm so mad that the camera died because some interesting things happen after that point. Um, and of course, I don't know that it's dead because I'm completely out of it and covered in eye, you know, yeah. eye, eye coverings and it's pitch black dark anyways. But yeah, like the, the entity gives all three of us a gift. Yep. Says, I give each of you a gift. Something else that really interesting happened was that it seemed like the entity visited me three times um, as if time had passed in between these things, but for us, it was a second. Well, you know, at one point in time, it even says, um, oh, you again. Yeah. How long has it been? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Time is irrelevant mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, and so that happened mm-hmm. like two or three times um, where you could tell uh, the, the entity had been gone for a long time and came back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, offered us these gifts, um, different things like that. Um, and then the, the 20 minutes was up. And thank, uh, good good news is is that you, A, quickly turned on your voice recorder, but then we also remember the thermal cameras recording yeah. vocals, so at least we have that, but we don't know if I pointed at someone or anything like yeah. that. Though the next uh, day or two, I did have a dream where I was floating above the, um, the, the, the camera and I saw myself point uh, at you first, Santosh second, and at myself third. So, Well, and having gone back and listened to the audio again, to try to transcribe what's being said. I mean, you do say, uh, or the voice says, I guess for you, I give, um, for, for, you know, for you, I give, and then for him, what for him, what shall I give to him for him? I give. And then almost like more of a looking at itself Hmm. in in the vessel that it's in. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, talk about the 20 minutes being up, um, and what happened next when you guys tried to wake me up. Yeah, so you know, like I, I had asked before, shine a light in my right. eye so I don't get scared. Because you always freak out. Because you are a fraidy cat and you do yeah, freak out. I almost punched somebody at the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I get up at the twenty minute mark, um, go over to uh, to shine the light in your face, and we typically, you know, just kind of touch on the knee. Mm-hmm. That's a symbol. So I touch you on the knee, you don't come out of it. I'm still talking. You're still this, talking. Right? You you know throughout the entire thing you said like like randomly you would say numbers yeah so. didn't I, didn't he say like trust the numbers or or am I just thinking of terrorist email I don't think you said trust the number you said there's there's a missing number oh there's missing number yeah, yeah. and then yeah throughout the whole Cy- thing I'm, cipher came up but it was more yeah yeah and I dropped a lot context. of the numbers a lot of different numbers and yep. stuff like that yeah. so um so anyway so I tapped you on the knee you didn't come out of it you you were still talking but like it stopped abruptly. You said three more numbers, and then I tapped you on the forehead, and you came out. Yeah, because you looked at me, and I, I work with people in trance, so I, I knew you you had gone deep just by the sound of certain things, so I was already awake, alert and awake. And so when Josh looked at me after tapping you, it's sort of a confirmation. It's like, oh, crap, he's in deep. Not that we didn't know you had already probably mm-hmm. slipped too deep anyway. I was I motioned. I was like, touch him, touch him on the third eye. And that's that's what brought you out because there's a there's a couple of ways to I don't want to say forcefully but a little a little more oomph in your bring out if somebody's stuck too deep in trance and that was one of the ways yeah so as soon as you guys touched me on the forehead um I. I, I abruptly awoke and had no idea where I was and I couldn't see and I was freaking out. Yeah, you forgot that you had a blindfold on <laughs> yeah. and that it was pitch black and you're like, I can't see, I can't see. And we're like, of course, Santosh and I are laughing because you're wearing a blindfold, dummy. You know, <laughs> But I didn't, well, I didn't yeah. with noise canceling earphones on so there's right. nothing we could have said. Yeah, I mean, I was scared out of my mind because I've got like this AM station static flipping in my ear. I can't yeah. see. I didn't know where I was my body felt like used <laughs> like it did I mean it felt exhausted <laughs> like I couldn't move and I didn't and it took me a second to like gather myself um, and even get out of the chair I think I, I felt like I sat in the chair for another hour just trying to get myself together because it, it, it once I realized where I was I felt like no time had passed yeah you were fully first, in the like, time dilation yeah yeah, I mean, it, and that seems to happen. I mean, for the person, excuse me, for the person that's that's like you know sensory deprived and that's mm-hmm. under, time seems to just go by really quick. You know, like a twenty sec, a twenty minute session, only feels like maybe you know a couple seconds or a couple minutes at most. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can I can imagine that you know you having basically surrendered your body to this other spirit would probably even have more of a time dilation. Yeah, it was, 
it was it was very very spooky um and then uh we got santosh up going up next we got a new battery for the night vision um and you were channeling a bit and and really kind of flowing um it was really interesting did you have any specific experiences yourself was that to me would you say it again you just yeah i was just saying did you have some interesting experiences yourself while you were under or what was that like for you because i know it was different than the first time you did it yeah my my approach to the second estus was completely different the first time i'd made the mistake you told me of trying to listen for the specific words Mm -hmm. and i sort of took a step back to let the sounds cascade over and see if they made sounds together, you know, Mm -hmm. and sentences. Um, And so I sort of switched back and forth between hearing a couple of words and saying four or five at a time, you know, like listening for 30 seconds and then saying those five words. Right. I heard or and breaking it up in chunks, just trying to play with the flow. And yeah, I found a I found a different space with it because I felt like the first night they were trying to teach me how to use the box. I, I think I mentioned that. Like yeah. it seemed like there was the conversation going on. Very much seemed like it was trying to be like, okay, you know, you're you're trying too hard. And your your session had put me in a weird space, so I knew I wasn't going to go too deep mm-hmm. because I was sort of I, I was on guard at that point and. I, it's much more enjoyable the second time. I'm actually excited to do it the time after. I, fi- I find that um, for me, one of the most novel experiences was Josh transcribing it and yeah. sending that copy in our group chat. And so it was really interesting to look. I was trying to follow the sounds and say the words without judging them or changing them. The experience of the night the memory and then going back over and reading the word hello are you done talking it was, it was getting really weird on the internet yeah it got connection. super glitchy it was weird yeah guys my well we could i think that would be a good segue regardless of what i said which was it was an interesting experience we've all been experiencing like hella tech issues this week yeah this is a good way to kind of wrap up i mean because we were all scared when we left i mean we kind of scooted back yeah. to the car and things like that. Um, but yeah, we've been, we've all been having some kind of tech issues. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I saw a freaking plane buzz my work today, like one of those Cessnas. Um, and right around the same time, the computer started glitching my, like my work phone restarted. Um, and it went into like the blue screen of death. And then my phone itself was glitching. And then like 10 minutes later, a black helicopter, like, in, I'm in Portland, Kentucky. There's a field next to where I work. A black helicopter comes down, stops. I don't see any markings on it, goes back up, and then flies away. And at that same point, my phone restarts itself. And I'm like, what the heck? Yeah, and I, I've also had some weird kind of glitchy things. You know, my phone just acting really weird. Uh, I called uh, my wife the other day, and when I when she picked up, I heard this like, weird kind of eh, eh, eh like that kind of noise. Almost. We've all been hearing some beeping noises in our phone calls, which is interesting since John Keel talked about that happening a lot right. to him after Mothman stuff. So, well, and uh, remember we were joking. I don't remember if we caught this on, on audio, if we were talking about this, but when we were talking with Joe a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. I can't remember if this was part of the show or part of the, the pre conversation. But we were joking that, you know, what do we have to do to take interest of people? And he said, when you start to know, notice noises on your phone connections yeah. or your internet slow and things like that, that's when you know that somebody's messing with you. Yep. Yeah, I heard a man's voice on a phone call and had to hang up. Like a friend and I, she was like, maybe we should hang up and call back on the 27th. Like it sounded like uh, somebody, somebody talking in an office dropped in. You know, like like some you know, like somebody accidentally presses the wrong button, yeah, and, yeah. and talks. So weird. Yeah, like that. That one got me the most. That set me on the paranoia train hard. Yeah, I know, especially because I'm reading. You know, uh, they knew too much about flying saucers, yeah. and so he's already getting into Men, men in Black yeah. stuff, and of course, thinking about Keel's stuff, talking about Men in Black, which we didn't even discuss any of that in terms of Mothman. The people that got these yeah. sightings from these people that were looking for drinks of water and yeah. things like it just so, so much craziness that we didn't even touch on the mothman prophecies because it was just about the mothman right um but yeah that was essentially our weekend man um we were exhausted the next day driving home yeah i mean i i got you know i got home i had 
a series of really weird dreams. Like I was, mm-hmm. I felt mm-hmm. weightless at one point, felt like I was floating through a corridor. Um, like there was some entity or something standing next to me. I woke up uh, uh, twice. I woke up and didn't open my eyes, but had like my eyelids were fluttering really mm-hmm. fast. And I was seeing like this flurry of images flash in front of my vision, uh, almost like I was getting some kind of a download or install or yeah, something. Was- I mean, it was just, yeah, so it's it's been a wild, and <clears throat> I mean even even like the last three nights, I don't feel like I've slept. Same. I, same. Like I feel like I I wake up in the morning and I'm just my dragging ass. My man. wife last night that like had essentially kind of chastised me because I haven't spent any time with her because I just keep going to the back bedroom and laying down because I'm so mentally and physically exhausted. You know, Sunday night, I mean, essentially I ate and went straight to bed. Monday night, I was just, you know, after we did our recordings and stuff, like I went and just laid down in the room and then Tuesday I edited all night. So I was kind of lost. And then last night, again, I was so tired and I just went and laid and she's like, are we going to spend any time together? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even realize it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it, just needless to say the weekend has extended into the week, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I guess that, I guess that's it for our creaky, 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 creaky ketchup, <laughs> creaky, ketchup. <laughs> creaky, creaky, creaky ketchup. ketchup. No, it's supposed um, to be Megatron ketchup. Yeah, Megatron ketchup. Um, but yeah, um, what an interesting experience. I mean, I think we plan on hopefully doing this once a year. We had such a great time, and we want to get back to West Virginia and check out stuff with like the Grafton Monster and uh, check out uh, yeah. Gray Barker's uh, files that they files have at the, the museum library. Yeah. Uh, and all that stuff. But man, what an interesting experience. I highly recommend everyone go to Point Pleasant take the trip uh, even right now like I said they're pretty safe about everything yeah. uh, it's pretty amazing uh, go check out Point Pleasant go check out Flatwoods and, and West Virginia and all that and thanks to everyone that uh, was just so kind to us yep. while we were very, there very courteous everybody we, we met so. yep um, so the other thing I want to say is don't forget we are going to be um, putting out Dome Chants uh, we're going to be dome putting chance, that out chance. on I'm not sure where where it will be located, but it'll be available for purchase. Um, once we get all those together, that'll be a way to help kind of fund our trip for next year or whatever, just kind of a fun thing for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I played the flute, we've got chants, we've got all kinds of stuff. We even did the hell year, bing, 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 yep. uh, but done it in a uh, round type thing with harmony and it was really really my cool. hand didgeridoo may or may not appear on one yeah of them. It may or may not appear but it was really fascinating and really fun uh i hope you guys will check that out when we post that online as well as the future of the documentary coming down the line which is all kind of pointing towards the thing that we are announcing which is the fearscape media network bum, um, bum, bum, bum. some of you have already seen that um we have uh created the Fearscape Media Network as a way to put uh, all the things that we love under one umbrella. Yeah. Um, all, we have, we, uh, some of you guys know we've got my new podcast coming out called Misters of the Dark, um, which is Lance Wayne and I, uh, who used to do Unhappy Campers, we're doing a horror podcast together, Misters of the Dark, uh, and pays homage to uh, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Uh, we, the, uh, I believe the first episode dropped a few days ago so uh check that out that's one of the new podcasts there's going to be some new podcast tales from the fearscapes going to be on there hopefully we get santosh's podcast on there um Woo. and all kinds of really great stuff that we're going to do so we're going to have a podcast network as well as a youtube network um we've uh we've uh, partnered up a little bit with uh, Keith Age, you know, our good buddy, Keith Age. We've partnered with him and his production company, uh, Black Leather Productions, to help produce some more YouTube content down the road. Um, so we really hope to see this Fearscape Media Network really explode. We've got some new content coming out. If you haven't already seen, we've got Paranormal Tech, or we're re- reviewing Paranormal Tech. We've got the Fearscape Unhinged. We've got a new episode getting ready to drop on that. Um, two, we just all kinds of neat yeah, stuff. Just a lot of stuff coming, branching out into more than more than just a podcast and really uh, available, you know, wherever you, to cover a wide range of topics. And, you know, the podcast network won't just be 
paranormal. I mean, it may be like Stefan said, he's got a horror one, you know, it's Antosh. Yours is more around Just magic and yoga yeah, magic and, and hypnosis. And My sister and I eventually will put together a podcast and hopefully Santosh and I will put something together someday talking about uh, just Wicca and all kinds of fun stuff like that, a cult. And, um, and, and, you know, if you have a podcast out there that you're interested in joining our network, hit us up. Um, hit us up at uh, fearscapepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to take a look at it and see if we could make it a part of our network where we have a huge sharing system um, that we share things. And we've recently created a new Facebook group called the Fearscape Media Network. So you can search Fearscape Media Network and then click uh, join to join the group. Uh, it is an open group. We just have a few rules that we want you to uh, adhere to. But not only are you getting access to all the podcasts and all the shows on Fearscape Media Network, but you're also, it's a place where people are sharing news stories, they're sharing ghost stories, their experiences, any UFO sightings. Um, it's kind of this like central hub of all things paranormal uh, that people are our fans and and you guys and things like that are getting together to find a community together. So, yep. So please check that out uh, as well as um, make sure to put in your uh, bookmarks, uh, fearscapemedia.com. That'll also be a centralized area for all the podcasts and things like that. Check out Misters of the Dark. Check out all the good stuff that's coming out soon. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Santosh, thank you so much for spending 15 hours with us here today just to record this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how long we it's running, it. but it feels like it's the longest episode ever. But it had to be. It yeah. had to be. Uh, but mm. we have some really great podcast episodes coming up over the next couple of weeks. You guys don't yep. even know. Santosh, you got any plugs you want to uh, plug here before we get out of here? Uh, Santosh David 333 across most social media will find the things. Uh, eventually, uh, we'll be rolling out under this uh, media uh, behemoth you all are, are doing. I'm happy <laughs> to be a part of the Psychic Sleep Hour with Santosh. Psychic Sleep happens on um, Sunday evenings. That's a live guided meditation happening. Uh, should be able to find it all through Santosh David 333. Awesome. All sorts of stuff. And yeah, we yeah, we definitely love to have you back again as usual. Just join us again for other topics and things like that. And we are so very excited about your podcast. We're looking forward to that and all that stuff. But yeah, we gotta get out of here, man. We have talked so yep. long. I'm pretty sure it's Friday now. Yeah, I think it is indeed <laughs> Friday. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Go to Point Pleasant, do all that stuff. This has been Stefan. I will catch you on the flip side. This has been Josh. The truth is out there. This has been Santosh, and I still don't have a byline. <laughs> of course you don't. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. I'm so glad you were able to join us for that horrifying discussion. I hope they didn't frighten you too much. <laughs> Tune in next week for even more research into the nightmarish and haunting creeps and spooks that we tell ourselves don't exist, but we know they do. Make sure you have your blankets that you hold them extra tight. Next time on Fearscape. <laughs>